Welcome to the Logan Bartlett Show. I am your host, Logan Bartlett. And what you're going to hear on this episode is a conversation I have with Emmett Shear. Emmett is the co-founder and former CEO of Twitch, one of the most influential tech platforms in recent memory. From its humble beginnings as a reality television show focused on one of his friends to the most influential online community that exists. to came up with a framework for prioritizing features, which is I got out of talking to a bunch of streamers and they wanted fame, love, and money. Is this thing producing more money, more fame, or more love? Great. We will prioritize resources again those. Is it not? Then it's not important and we're not going to do that. Emmett and I take the conversation in a bunch of different directions about how he learned to grow as a leader and how he ultimately sold the business to Amazon and then stayed on for another 10 years after that running the company. Amazon actually lets CEOs be CEOs. If you want to sell your company and keep running it, I couldn't recommend any really any big tech company other than Amazon. How do we just make sure Twitch continues to be the best place for streamers? We also talk about why he thinks remote work is actually bad for most tech companies. There's a reason why Silicon Valley is taking over. You can't take that culture and transplant it into a remote work environment and expect it to work. Emmett was a part of the first Y Combinator batch in 2006, along with the founders of Reddit and Sam Altman. And so we talk what it was like in the early days of working with Paul Graham at YC. You somehow walk away from the conversation with Paul believing we are the shit. We are smart, capable, and we're going to take over the world. The only thing standing between us and taking over the world is we have to go grind even harder. Road trips are not tours of gas stations, and your life shouldn't be a tour of money picking. Finally, Emmett shares what he's most concerned about with artificial intelligence. So here's now Emmett. Emmett, thanks for doing mm -hmm. this. Um, you had four co-founders of Twitch, Justin TV. Mm -hmm. uh, you stayed on and ran Twitch. Michael has been running various aspects of YC over the years. Uh, Kyle started Cruise after mm -hmm. he left. And then Justin Kahn is a quasi-internet celebrity at this point. I mean, he, he's gone through a bunch of stuff, but yeah. yeah. He had Atrium. He had a... Exec, Atrium. Um, and now, yeah. Now I think uh, internet celebrity and uh, DJ. DJ. Got it. Interesting guy. Uh, what made your relationships with their co-founders such that you guys all stayed together and worked well together over the years? So uh, I've known Justin since I was eight. Uh, we grew up together in Seattle, went to school together. Uh, school being high school uh, and college. Element, elementary school, uh, middle school. We actually didn't go to the same high school, but then we did go to the same college again. Um, and uh, I met we met Michael uh, in college, probably closer to Justin than to me. Uh, and then Kyle, we recruited out of MIT uh, as we were starting the company. He was, a, uh, he was a, I think, a sophomore at the time. How did and you come across Kyle? We sent an email to the MIT, like, hackers who want projects list, and two people replied, and one of them was Kyle. Huh. Um, and uh, he thought we seemed credible because we'd built a startup and sold it uh, on eBay before. And we thought he seemed credible because he sent us a 27-page PDF with CAD drawings. And so we... Uh, uh, we wound up we wound up picking him up. Selling a startup on eBay, by the way, we glossed over that, but uh, you, you literally listed the IP for your yeah. company on eBay, which is an interesting separate story. You've, yeah. you've told it. You've told it enough. <laughs> I won't we'll make you tell can, it again. But I can tell the short version of it, which is that we started a copy of Google Calendar, but before Google Calendar existed, and after Google launched Google Calendar, we were like, oh, we don't really have any other ideas for what to do other than a JavaScript calendar on the internet, and they already did that. So uh, we decided we'd sell it. Uh, we didn't know how to sell something on the internet, like how to sell us a software company, uh, especially one that wasn't like a, a real acquisition. And so we thought we'd just list it on eBay, uh, which which worked actually. We sold it for like a quarter million dollars, um, which um, I think is actually a good demonstration of like the kind of thing you have to do in startups a lot, which is you, you have to just figure out how to solve a problem uh, even if the standard paths don't, the, you have to make up what the, what it is. Um, there's a lot of making it up uh, that has to happen for for something like a startup because almost by definition the normal stuff isn't isn't all set up. Was that a PR? Did you know it was going to be kind of PR stunty and that that would lead to distribution? And yeah, awareness? yeah, that was that was the idea. That was part of it. The idea was we were like we need to get people to know we're selling it. How do we reach them? Oh, if we list it on eBay, that'll be funny. We can get people to write an article about that. Um, it was very intentional. And it actually um, worked. And it worked. No, it totally worked. It worked, yeah. it worked as planned, actually. Yeah. Minus the fact that eBay took down our listing because we had two links in it um, about five days into the seven-day listing. And we, we had to relist it, which was kind of a heart-stopping experience because we had one bid at $50,000 at that point. And we were like, no, we've lost our bidder. 
Uh, but it turns out that, uh, that that didn't actually hurt us at all. Yeah. So you had the credibility of that. And so Kyle was like, these guys have credibility. Yeah, they, they must know what they're doing. Yeah. I, I think Kyle overestimated how much credibility that should have given us. But uh, it, did, it did prove that we were the kind of people who like could actually build things um, and sell them. So that's, I guess, it wasn't a zero. And there was a deep level of trust, but also some dysfunction among the group. Kyle went nocturnal for a while to avoid <laughs> conflicts. And like, so yeah, but, there's actually, we did a podcast about this, uh, an Only Friends episode with which the four is, co-founders. Which is great. It, it's super entertaining. Two hours of yeah. like you guys shooting the shit. Yeah. And so if you, if you want the, the full, full deep details version of it, but the high level version is uh, like it worked because all four of us trusted each other. Um, and we somehow managed to pick four people who were smart, hardworking, you know, competent. But I think most of all, who had the, who understood what it meant to be part of a we, not not a bunch of individuals always thinking about whether or not, uh, how is this working for me? Um, and I think that that's what makes, uh, that's what makes partnerships work. Um, both probably like uh, romantic partnerships and business partnerships. Because if you're going to be in a, a partnership, not an employer-employee relationship, but a partnership relationship, you can't always be thinking about whether or not are, you can't be modeling what what are they doing? Are they are they trying to what are, what's their incentive versus my incentive versus the company's incentive? It's dramatically simplifying. It makes everything a lot easier if you can just only think about what is right for the company and then just ignore everything else. Um, and I think that that's something that goes wrong in a lot of uh, a lot of things, and it's it's what causes instability because suddenly when there's lots of interest at stake, there is conflict about my interest versus your interest. But when you can simplify it to, well, what is our interest? And everyone everyone can actually commit to that. Uh, it works pretty well. Is there any way to solve for that as you're now working more with entrepreneurs? Um, yeah, be, be that way yourself. Yeah. Like the, the number one the number one cause of the problem in all of your relationships is you. <laughs> That's true, again, romantically and in business. Uh, and the solving so to, for, for how do I actually buy into this is this is we we are doing this is really important and then also obviously you need to work with people who have that mindset as well but you have less control over that and you have less ability to detect it and at some level you know you have to trust and hope but uh i think there's something about if if you do it first of all you can control that so that's good but second of all it brings it out of other people when they when they can see that you're serious about we and you're not you're not Run, you're not gaming them. You're not cheating. Uh, you're not like pretending you're about all about we and then actually being about yourself. People respond to that. It draws it out of your partner as well. So you launched and shipped a bunch of products over the years uh, that ultimately led to Twitch. So there was a calendar for Gmail, which was mm -hmm. you and Justin. Then after that, social network for families, SoundCloud, like business, a web crawler that mapped popularity like clout, a flexible to-do list, kind of an Airtable-ish thing, mm -hmm. an Evite competitor, something that was mm -hmm. kind of similar to GitHub, Heroku, Replit, whatever you want to call it. Then Justin TV, ultimately Twitch. I heard you say something interesting. When learning, you get exposure to a wide variety of problems related to the topic. They actually teach you how to understand and see the differences between things. You don't just study one piece of music to learn music. Did all these experiments and all the different products that you guys iterated on, did it actually help prepare you for Twitch's success or were they just aimless cycles along the way? Um, I think they did help prepare us. I think the main thing they actually prepared me for was building. Like I did learn something from the product work on it, but honestly we did such a bad job on the product uh, design aspects of it and the, the sort of business design aspects of it that I didn't learn as much from that as I'd like to. What I what we learned from is the engineering side of it, like the design side of it. Like, how do you actually build a thing that like functions and and has uh, has functionality and not too many bugs? And I got a ton out of stuff on the uh, uh, on the building side. I would say on the on the how does stuff work side and le learning how to design how to how to build a product, how to build a successful business. Um, the stuff I built myself was probably only a tenth of the data. Mostly I was like obsessively studying how other businesses worked um, because you get a lot more, you can only launch a new thing every you know few weeks if you're fast, usually every few months, like a significant new thing. 
but there's new stuff being launched all the time. And if you want the number of reps you need, you can't just learn from your own your own mistakes. You have to be learning from everyone else's mistakes and everyone else's successes at the same time. And I think that's the uh, that was my you know my primary uh, you know, I don't know university for that was it what what was with Justin with Michael with Kyle every lunch every night every weekend like the, we just talked about startups nonstop and the thing we would often be talking about would be not our startup, but like, oh, why is, you know, Facebook is working. Why is Facebook working? Why are they beating MySpace? Like what's different about it? Why, what's good about their strategy? What's not good about their strategy? Um, and that, and really carefully paying attention and trying out and like using the product and and paying attention to what is actually working in the real world, you learn a lot. Um, and I think that's where, that's probably the main thing I learned from from a design point of view. Um, I, 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 I joke that that's my main only value as a career finance person investor is one, I'm used to just giving advice and letting people decide. You know, I'm yeah. not used to having actually owning the decision myself, which is actually can be nice as a board member. Like, hey, here mm-hmm. are the options. And two, you get to simulate out a lot of different data points for all the companies that come in and pitch. And so you're you can extrapolate on a, a bunch of different stuff there. One uh, of the things that uh, I, have a, I have a friend, uh, Matt, who uh, uh, almost started our first company with us, but instead went into, went into finance and, you know, runs a hedge fund and uh, uh, has worked at a bunch of the finance jobs over the years. Uh, and he's an, he's an investor. And what I've discovered is investors have this inc- just in totally different lens, at least, you know, public markets investors. And I think most private markets investors as well, who are later stage, where it's about like, whether the industry is good and like the capital allocation and like the structure of the business, which is not something actually that founders think about all that much. And I think, I think it's right that founders don't think about that because for the first two, three years of a company, it doesn't matter. Like just build something people want and sell it to them, like ignore everything else. But as you get bigger and bigger, those things become actually quite important. And you start to try to think about, oh, well, we're in this industry, but we could be in this adjacent industry. And there's some way to shift how our business is perceived or what kind of work we do and how, what's the structure of how capital flows work and can we change that? And those actually do become very important questions. But like usually later, um, there's sort of a handoff that happens. It's, it, it's funny to hear you all talk about like iterating on the product and trying to find something. And one of the throwaway lines I've heard, I don't know if it was you or Justin or someone saying, we could go be, build enterprise software, but that's boring and we don't want to go do that. I was like, you know, in 2006 or 2007, you would have created a lot of value doing enterprise software. And you were just like, hey, n- not for us. That's yep. too boring to go pursue it. Um, I think uh, we, 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 we talked about building instead of Twitch or Social Cam, um, because Michael went and uh, founded Social Cam, which he wound up selling to Autodesk. That was weird in a way. The Autodesk thing never really made sense to me. Um, we talked about building a WebEx competitor because like WebEx is obviously a huge market like teleconferencing. And we have like no doubt we could build a better product than WebEx because WebEx is annoying to use, which we're basically talking about Zoom, Zoom right? Yeah. Like a more consumer version of WebEx is Zoom. Um, and we decided against it because we knew it would involve enterprise, not, not the product side of it, but the sales side of it. Like enterprise sales is like a whole business. And uh, we just like had no interest in like learning how to do that. Um, and it's actually, uh, I think, I think a good example of sort of knowing yourself. Like I actually don't think I would have had, I think I probably could have learned how to do it, but I don't think I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something else. And I think it's, it's important for founders to do after the thing that they're interested in. Um, although, it was also a better time for consumer. Like I think, uh, we did Twitch worked. There were a lot of actually good consumer companies started around that time. It got a lot harder to win in consumer as the big players consolidated uh, more of distribution. And uh, I think, uh, I think three or four years later, maybe we would have pivoted into enterprise just because lack of any credible other option. Just getting distribution would have been really mm-hmm. hard with, and certainly today it's a huge. Yeah. Pain. Um, there's an Ira Glass quote that I like a lot, and I know you do as well. I think I've quoted it before. Uh, I won't read the whole thing, but nobody tells this to people who are beginners. I wish someone told me. All of us who do creative work, we get into it because we have good taste, but there is a gap. For the first couple of years you make stuff, it's not that good. It's trying to be good. It has potential, but it's not. But your taste, the thing that got you to the game, is still killer, and your taste is why your work disappoints you. A lot of people never get past this phase. They quit. 
Most people I know who do interesting creative work went through years of this. We know our work doesn't have the special thing that we want it to have. We all go through this. And if you are just starting out or you are in this phase, you got to know it's normal. And the most important thing you can do is put in the work. Going through that period, it's a it's sort of profound quote. Mm-hmm. And I think it can be applied to a lot of different things. As you guys were iterating on all of it, did you did you know that your products just weren't that good? And was it disappointing along the way to ship all these different things and not have it take off like you hoped it would? Yeah, I'd say there's, I had that in three different layers. Um, the first was from an engineering perspective. I just wasn't that good of an engineer. I knew what good engineering looked like. I remember visiting for the friend feed offices, which had like Paul Buhite, who's like inc- inventor of Gmail, incredible mm-hmm. programmer. I think who else was there? Maybe like Brett Taylor, like like really insanely good programmers, and them talking about their engineering process and like me using their product and seeing the engineering behind it, and just being like, oh, that's what that's what I'm su- trying to do. That and like the thing, I- I'm just like. In- incompetent like the thing i'm doing i'm just doing this all wrong um and then spending like 10 years trying to get better at building stuff and eventually i i I did learn how to build stuff more like the way that they did um and it it was better but it was it was 10 years of like being quite disappointed in the quality of the engineering i was doing it was it worked but it it wasn't like uh it wasn't well designed It it wasn't good um and then there was this, the product side where um, I I did I didn't think I didn't I wasn't that disappointed in the the, the micro design of the products. I actually thought we did a pretty good job there from fairly early, and to some degree, it's a uh, it's a little different from uh, from other kinds of creation thing and things. Sort of like whatever you can think of, you can kind of do. Like copying is very easy at that level. And so if you have good taste, you can just copy good stuff and it, it works. But at the macro level, there is this thing missing where like we weren't good at business. Well, we weren't good at figuring out what do we need to build that people will actually want. And the constant disappointment was that we'd build stuff and I wouldn't have actually solved the problem for the person. Like, and that was very frustrating and like hard to uh, hard to deal with. Um, and uh, there was this sense of like uh, that that's that's almost more like learning to do science. I would say the engineering thing is the thing where I felt the Ira Glass quote the strongest. The and about like I had this level of taste where I could really see what I was trying to do and I just couldn't achieve it with my hands. The other thing was not understanding like. Uh, it's like I was, I was, I was a grad student. I was writing papers and they were getting published, but I knew I wasn't actually like discovering anything that's that important. Like the, the papers just weren't on important discoveries. And I was somehow missing, I knew I was missing something. Um, but that's a, that's a slightly different thing than the, than the Eric Glass question. Justin TV. So you, the original idea for it, for people that don't remember was actually following Justin, your co-founder, around for 24 hours a day, filming 100% of his life. Mm-hmm. Did you did you actually think at that time that like that you would be a reality television studio business, or did you know this was kind of a means to some end, and you were mucking around? The idea was always that we would open it up for other people to produce shows. Like we never thought we were going to be the people doing the production of everything. You were going to license the right. MTV or whatever. Yeah, yeah. We, we thought we were produ- building a technology to enable ourselves to make the first live streaming reality show and that other people would then go on to build, make more live streaming reality shows using using what we built, which, you know, within one order of magnitude is what, what happened. Um, but where we got, what, what went wrong was that, uh, uh, with that vision was that like reality TV requires editing Live reality TV is a bad idea. I just didn't really understand how the entertainment. I didn't understand. We didn't understand anything about anything. So that that was that was crazy. But actually, at a level below that, we were very very right because what we what we actually had was that Justin, uh, who uh, has always been you know living in the future a little bit when it comes to this kind of stuff, uh, really wanted to be an influencer and really wanted the attention and wanted 
thought it would be cool to like live stream a lot about of, 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 of his life, which was a thing that not a lot of people had done at that point. And we built the technology to enable him to live his influencer dreams. And that turned out to be quite powerful, actually. Um, the number one thing we did right with Justin TV, the thing I would encourage everyone who's trying to build consumer software to do, is we built something for ourselves. We built the thing that we wanted to use every day, or at least one person on our team wanted to use every day. And uh, most of the innovations on Twitch, on Justin TV, were things we invented for ourselves running the show because we thought they'd be fun. Like the idea of having uh, our own custom emotes and chat that are like faces of the people on the show, that Twitch still does that today. Uh, and we had that idea because we were running the show. We would never have come up with it in, the, in a vacuum. And so I think there's something really powerful about that approach. Even though we were we were wrong about the reality TV show thing, we were right about people wanting to do live streaming. I mean, Twitch was ultimately a version of just Justin TV. It was just more uh, verticalized or specialized. Uh, do you think, had you kept at Justin TV? I guess, why didn't you guys keep at Justin TV? Why, why didn't you keep plowing ahead? We we'd gotten Justin TV profitable after the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, I've spent about a year, you know, cutting costs, generating revenue, just iteratively focused on money. And you had a doomsday clock actually yeah. on the wall. Yeah, yeah. Is we, that something you would recommend to every, people? It wasn't on the wall. It was every every Friday we would sit down with the employees and be like, we've got, we've got, you know, 14 months. We've got 11 months. We've got, I think at the worst case, it was like we were down to like nine weeks. Um, it was certainly clarifying. I think uh, I only recommend it if you can convince people on the team that we can succeed. Otherwise, people will start uh, packing their bags and looking elsewhere. Pretty fatalistic. Um, but I think I think the founding team never showed any indication, nor ever had any indication or belief that we weren't going to figure it out. We were we were very sure. And also, we we started share. We didn't start sharing it when there's like two months left. We started sharing it quite far in advance, um, and everyone could see that while the clock was ticking down, the rate was getting better, and we were making progress. And so it felt like, oh yeah, yeah. We are pulling the plane out of the dive. It might be a close thing, but like they could, people could see that we were going to get there. So was the pursuit of profitability ultimately at the expense of Justin TV's success as a standalone? Oh, uh, it, was, it was at the expense of our growth. Uh, and then so we had this thing that wasn't growing. We we're trying to decide. It was profitable, but un not growing. And we we're trying to decide, okay, what do we do from here? And... Uh, no one thought just pursuing Justin. T we had no good ideas for ideas for what to do to like reinvigorate growth of Justin TV per se. And so we had, you know, Michael, they did a pivot into so much built some mobile video stuff, which in an era before before Snapchat and before TikTok, pretty good insight. Yeah. Um, I like Autodesk watching didn't seem to execute on the uh, the vision of the consumer video. Yeah, app we there. didn't quite get there, but yeah. but like, but it, it, there was a there was a there there for totally. sure. Um, and uh, I wanted to do the, the video game thing because I was watching video games on uh, on Justin TV and enjoying it. Um, but the big pivot from Justin TV to Twitch, like the real difference between the two companies is not the gaming versus the uh, general purpose thing. That's a superficial change. Um, and it motivated me to focus on a set of customers. Um, but I think we could have, in retrospect... I know why we did the rebrand and like, but we actually had a debate at the time whether we needed to do, do the rebrand. And I think we probably would have been successful without it. I think the rebrand was helpful and it was, uh, it made more sense like the, uh, for the, uh, for the company. And so it was probably like, you know, a good idea. I would do it again, but not strictly necessary. We would have found some amount of a similar level of success regardless. And, uh, no, but the big change, the big change was, was, I realized that the important customer for live was the streamer, not the viewer. That that ultimately for live video, unlike for uh, uh, for YouTube, um, we we could not say, well, whatever the creators will deal with it. What matters is the audience. They're just here for an audience. They weren't really there for the audience. the The audience was there for them, and you have to keep winning the streamer's business every day because if you don't, they're going to go stream somewhere else. And now. There's no library of content like there is for the uh, for something like YouTube, and so 
you can't just have people show up, create a little bit and leave. That like that doesn't work. You need people creating all the time. And so the focus had to be how do we build something great for streamers? Um, and that's why we invented paying streamers money. That's why we like I went and interviewed a bunch of streamers and figured out here's what streamers need. Um, and that was a that was a much bigger shift than the gaming part was building a product that was designed for streamers first and foremost. Was the gaming thing an intuition on your part? I mean, you obviously enjoyed watching it. Uh, or was there, I guess, as you reached these conclusions, gaming and focusing on streamers and not the viewers, was there data that backed that up? Or was it just an intuition thing that you kind of realized? The gaming thing was purely intuition. I mean, you could point at data like there are a lot of gamers. If I was to do a McKinsey market research sure. thing, I could be like, oh, look, the size gaming industry is very large. Bessemer, People are increasingly spending more time on the internet. Bessemer's memo is uh, public from their yeah, investments, yeah. so you can go look at all their yeah. market sizing I, stuff. I actually went back and I found my e the email I wrote that's like, it's like uh, two paragraphs long, like a, like a half page email that's like, here's why gaming makes sense. And it's basically, it's the very abbreviated version of that argument. Um, advertisers like gaming, you know, like the game company's interests are aligned with ours. So the copyright stuff, like I thought about that, but the idea was purely intuition. I really like this. I bet I'm not that much of a weirdo. Like I, I like popular media. If I like watching this, it's likely to also be popular media. Um, the part that was more data backed was the streamer part. Um, I went and looked and found that there were about 200 people making gaming content and uh, who had any audience at all. And I was like, oh, if we get, you know, if we can can convince 180 of those people to stream on Twitch, we just win. Like there's just, there's just no, it's just unambiguous. There's no way we can lose actually. Um, and so we just pivoted the company to be fo wholly focused on that. And that I think was reasonably data driven in the sense that I went and like looked at, I looked at to just make the decision about viewer versus streamer. I went and actually got data and then thought about it. Um, although it was certainly informed by having worked in the space for five years and like having the intuition to sort of understand the dynamic of uh, what it would mean to win a streamer. And so the band kind of broke up at that point. Michael went with Social Cam. Justin left the company around right. then. And Kyle ran the legacy of what was Justin TV for a while. Yeah. So we uh, we actually weren't sure whether we wanted to do the Social Cam idea or the gaming idea. Instead of debate it, we were like, we're going to fund the gaming idea and the mobile idea as like Skunkworks projects. And then we're going to set goals. And if they hit the goals, we will pivot to them. And was this just um, jamming more ads on Justin TV to pay for this? We were already jamming more ads on Justin yeah. TV. That was just, that was already the plan. Pre-roll, mid-roll, banner. That was, that was already the plan. Yeah. The plan was already to extract. Like, we were already in the we were Justin TV plan unchanged. Extract maximum profit. Um, we then, but yeah, we, that that meant we were profitable, which meant we could fund like these projects. Um, and Twitch, we hit our goals. We hit like the we hit like said like a twenty five percent growth a month goal and we were hit like a 30 percent growth a month which is great um and how'd you go about actually doing that was that the work with the streamers yeah it was just it was the the exact you know process i was talking about of like oh there's 200 streamers let's call them how, what does it take to convince them i so saw kevin was one of the very first people who i think he was the first person i brought on to my my gaming team he was my the person i was like i need kevin and i was like kevin uh was our he was basically all the non-programming engineering stuff originally. Um, and I was like, Kevin, your mission is to convince people they need to stream gaming on Justin TV. Like, go talk to them and get them to do it. Um, and Kevin is probably one of the single best BD people I've ever worked with. And uh, he did a very good job of doing that. And, like, I backed him up with, he would be like, oh, they'll switch if we build this. And I'm like, great, on it. And then we just go build the thing. Um, Michael had, took two engineers and built, uh, and Justin kind of, uh, started working mostly on that project with Michael building uh, social cam. We didn't actually hit the social cam goals. It took them longer to build Twitch. Uh, the Justin TV gaming was like literally just built on Justin TV gaming. Like we didn't have to build a new product. We turned out we un overestimated how fast it was, it would be to build uh, an entirely new product from scratch for mobile gaming. So that they didn't hit the growth goals. We felt like the product they built was promising enough that it was worth doing the effort to spin it off. And in retrospect, we were right about that too. So we spun that off. Um, Michael went with it. Uh, Justin hung around for a few months, but like, I think, you know, 
was also feeling the itch to do something else. And I think wasn't, it's funny, Justin now like loves Twitch and like with, learned what the product was. I think at the time didn't really understand or love the gaming streaming product. And so he was like, didn't want to work on it that much, which totally makes sense to me. Um, and then Kyle uh, was figuring out what to do, graciously ran the legacy business for me for like uh, more than a year, I think. And then found uh, Colin Carrier, who was our, uh, who was the, his replacement um, to run it. Uh, which was amazing because like that was basically funding the business. Um, so we needed someone good running it. Um, and then he went off to, to start cruise. I heard you say that people come for the entertainment, but stay for the relationships within the community. What, when did you realize there was something unique going on from a community standpoint? Yeah. Come for the video, stay for the chat. So, uh, when I first started building Twitch, I was using myself as the prototype viewer and I am, the type of viewer we've come to call a strat the strategist, which means I was there because I liked watching people who were good at the games that I like to play so I could learn from them, ask them questions, stuff like that. Almost like a group coaching session. Um, or I could watch esports and like like live uh, esports entertainment. And that was also, that was also uh, great for me. Um, it turned out very rapidly though that I was in the minority. Strategists make up about 20% of Twitch viewers. 80% of people were there because they liked they liked the hanging out. They liked the connection they got from hanging out with other people in chat. And talking to people, look, you know, watching them, it was just rapidly obvious, oh, I'm I'm actually not the prototype here. These other people are the prototype. Is that are those the two groups? Yeah, I mean you can you can, you actually can subdivide the community group more finely. So we have more psychographics underneath that, but there, at the top level, there's like, are you there for the entertainment or are you and then learning or are you there for the entertainment and then community? Um, and then there's, you can, you can go deeper. I'm curious, that, like, it, like, are there any broad strokes of the other types of people? It, it's, it comes down to like, are you, do you, are you about uh, the personality more or are you about uh, the chat vibe more? Like, what's the, what's the part of being here that's the most important thing? But like, it's a little inside baseball and fundamentally not that important because they all benefit from the same, like it, you don't actually build different products for different people. Yeah. So it doesn't, you know, it's, at some level it doesn't really matter. Um, whereas the the learning versus community thing is a really important uh, product impacting insight. Um, and so that's when we were sort of realized like, oh, people are there for the connection. Okay, that's the like real, that's the thing that they stick around for. Most of our users stick around for. Um, and so, that was uh, that was a pretty deliberate uh, learning from looking at our users. Like, wasn't we didn't just make it up? Were there, were there non obvious things that you did to cultivate the community, or ultimately, what is building the product for the streamer? Then it became obvious that they would cultivate the community. Yeah, no, I think that that was the that was the learning from focus on the streamer was like very very early. It's obvious if our customer is the streamer, then our job is to help them cultivate their community. I still believe that to be true. I don't think Twitch has communities. Twitch doesn't have any community. Twitch has streamers. Streamers have communities. And when people get confused and think that, oh, the community, people on Twitch care about Twitch. They don't care about Twitch. They care about the streamer. And our job is to facilitate that. Um, and it's very egoic, I think. It's like you get, you're like, you're telling the story that you're the hero. The streamer is the hero. Our job is to like, with the, one of the, the slogan we came up with for it later was we play support. Like the streamer is the carry. We are support. Um, and I think that's uh, that's a key like mental model for a product like Twitch. Twitch was able to uniquely beat back competition from a bunch of uh, heavily funded tech companies along the way. I guess what was the feeling? G Google had a famous tweet: "Welcome Player Two uh, right. when they when they announced their presence. Where were you when that happened? What was the sentiment around that? Yeah, so after we were acquired by Amazon, I think everyone else who was like, oh, maybe we'll acquire Twitch was like, oh, we're not going to acquire Twitch. Okay, uh, we better launch competitors. And so within like less than a year, Microsoft, Google, YouTube, and Facebook had all launched very explicit like Twitch competitors and started spending huge amounts of money bidding on streamers um, in a very non-sustainable way that wasn't, that was trying them trying to buy a critical mass um, of, uh, of audience. Uh, which was uh, was exhilarating. Um, I think it was actually, it was good for Twitch. Like competition is good is good for the service. Um, yeah, we we posted a kind of snarky tweet that sort of welcome player two uh, when when uh, YouTube launched theirs. Um, 
but I think that really was our attitude, which was like, if you can build a better product for the streamers, you're more than welcome and you should win. Um, but we think our product's better and we think streamers are going to choose us every time. And our strategy to beat everybody was we had to bid against people and stuff, but like ultimately we let a lot of streamers walk. Like we, we could have kept bidding more money. Um, and uh, we didn't outbid on everything. We outbid on a bunch of stuff, but like not everything. Um, and our focus was from the very first beginning, how do we just make sure Twitch continues to be the best place for streamers? Um, and how do we continue to make it so like, they continue to choose us instead of instead of the competition. And I've, uh, I remember re- reading a bunch of some streamers complaining about Twitch and be like, basically like, oh, I want to go to the you know YouTube, except like you know I feel like I, they're, they're offering me more money, but uh, and I'd go except, you know, it's not fair. Like Twitch, Twitch, Twitch has me trapped because because all the moderation tools are so much better and the this is better. I'm like, yeah, we you mean we trapped you by with our nefarious plan of building a better product that actually works. Yeah. Yes, uh, I fully admit this is our our, our secret plan. The ruse like, all along. The, yes, you, you didn't see it coming, but we would we're going to build stuff that you like and then give it to you for free. Um, yeah, so that's very diabolical. Yeah, it's totally diabolical. But like that, that was the that was the thing. Like we we won because our product was better, um, and uh, I think that's like a and it was better in the way people people cared about. There's a lot of nice to have features, um, like fun things that people think they want. Polls is the best example. I think we actually have a polls feature now, but for many, many years we did not. And our competition did. They had a polls feature. People would complain about this. But the truth is, you can run a poll using like a online, like there are many poll things you can just use on the internet if you want to. If we screw up chat moderation, if we screw up, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if your subscriptions don't work well, if discovery isn't good, you can't fix those things. Only we can. And you don't actually want us to build a poll. You think you do, but like the truth is you don't actually, and when you would confront them with the actual choice, would you like to make a dollar more per hour or would you like to us to build launch polls? Like, oh, a dollar, obviously. Like, what are you talking about? Like, okay, well, that's right. Okay, we're gonna keep working on the other thing then. How, how do you get to those conclusions? Like when you're hearing from your users, I want this thing, but being able to discern that they actually don't really want this thing at the expense of what it would take you yeah. to go do it. And is it actually framing it in those terms of, would you prefer an extra dollar or would you prefer like more engineers on this? Yeah. Or- so I, when I got started with Twitch, I, uh, I came up with a framework for prioritizing features, which is I got out of talking to a bunch of streamers and basically uh, asking them why they streamed and sort of what their goals were and what, what they what they wanted out of it. And what we came up with was they wanted fame, love, and money. Um, uh, fame, they want to like obviously reach an audience, grow it, have more people watch them, get more hours of video watched, basically. Um, love, they wanted to feel positive social feedback and connection for doing it. Whether that's from Twitch because they got invited to TwitchCon or because some uh, Twitch you know partner manager reached out or it's from their audience saying how great they lo- love the show and how amazing that was. Um, and then money, they wanted to make money on the stream. And basically... If we built something, and there's a secret fourth thing, which is like the video has to work. They want the live video to be like actually good enough. Okay, cool. That's a let's put that one aside. That's the uh, underpinning. That's the underpinning. Like you, that's the table stakes. That just has to work. Uh, assume it does. Um, is just thing producing more money, more fame, or more love? Great. Like we will prioritize resources against those. Is it not? Then it's not important, and we're not going to do that. Um, and uh, that worked because those were the three most important things. And then once you have that structure, you can kind of, it's easy to compare within money, which of these things we think will be most helpful to make the most money within discovery, which of these things in fame, which of these things will help grow audiences the most. Um, love is the trickiest one, obviously, because love is a little bit less, it's a little more fuzzier and less clear than fame and money are. But, uh, but ultimately it's like having good moderation in chat, um, having, uh, experiences for streamers where they feel they feel loved by by Twitch and that we care about them. Once upon a time, Google came and made an offer to buy Justin TV uh, before it was really in the before all the Twitch stuff mm-hmm. came to be. And ultimately, uh, you got far down the acquisition process, and then people on the team failed Google's uh, tests or something. They, they uh, Google was considered an aqua hire, and out of our like whatever I don't know thirty total people, they like had like 10 that they thought were like Google quality um, and made an offer on that basis. And we were just like, no. <laughs> uh, and in retrospect, I remember like looking at the offer and if, if they'd offered us three times more money, I think we would have taken it. Um, 
but uh, but I'm really glad they didn't offer us three times as much money. Um, same thing actually happened with Kiko on Yahoo. Yahoo offered to buy Kiko, which is your calendar, or the calendar company, for a million dollars in, but like in retention over like four years, so really like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in signing bonus, on top of a, you know, mid-level Yahoo engineer offer, and. I'm really glad they lowballed us because if they hadn't lowballed us, we might have taken it. And like, uh, uh, we didn't really want to do those. We didn't really want to work for Google or work for Yahoo. We wanted to run the company. It just it felt like you have to take. The, if they offered you a win, you could like you have to take it. Um, so I'm so I'm glad they didn't. Are there any lessons actually from either of those stories that are that you could extrapolate as a as something you would tell a founder, or is it hey those are funny situations and the road not traveled, but at the end of the day, it's just, there, there was nothing to be learned from the individuals. I don't, I don't really think I've, I, I've, the only time I ever use it is someone's like, oh, I got an acquisition offer from this company. Um, and I talked to them and I'm like, okay, this is, this is like an aqua hire. Here's like, here's how it's going to work. Like here's, here's how aqua hires work. And having been through one myself, I kind of like, I know what the, what the process will be like a little bit, although it does vary from company to company. It's not that variable. Um, and so occasionally it's helpful for advising someone who's in the exact same situation. But other than that, there's not really much, there's not much generalizable from it, I don't think. This might be an annoying question that just uh, people in the media and I guess venture capitalists ask you, but how much time have you given to thinking about Twitch as a standalone versus within Amazon? Oh, like whether we should have sold it or not? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, selling it uh, worked out really well for us because uh, Amazon really did let Twitch grow on its own. Did they help with bidding for streamers? And like, was that an expensive capital outlay that wouldn't have been obvious? Because the weird thing about Twitch versus Instagram, for example, is Instagram, it's hard to uh, disconnect Instagram within uh, Facebook, right? Because of all the stuff they did from an ad infrastructure standpoint and, you know, the adoption and promotion and all that. I think it's kind of hard for me to mentally disconnect the two. Twitch was, to your point, able to operate pretty standalone, right? Mm -hmm. And so almost you can, you can, at least from the outside in, maybe you disagree, almost see what the business would look like in some yeah. ways absent Amazon. Amazon what you, Amazon retained me as a CEO for a very long time, and it retains many of its CEOs for a very, very long time. Like How long? You were there? Don Katz at Audible, ten, for Ten years? Example. Eight years? Uh, eight years. Um, and uh, they do it because Amazon actually lets CEOs be CEOs. It's, like, it's, uh, it's the most decentralized of the big tech companies. And uh, I think... Uh, if you want to sell your company and keep running it, I couldn't recommend any really any big tech company other than Amazon because it's the only one that runs under that model. Um, I've thought about what it would be like to have done it separately. Um, and I actually just think it wouldn't have been that different. The biggest difference was, I, the reason I sold at the end of the day is I, I don't like fundraising. And I knew that if I sold to Amazon, I'd get to keep running my company. In fact, they would demand I keep running my company. and that, But we were aligned in that. I wanted to and they, want, they wanted me to, so great. And they would make sure that they would, they would fix the I have to raise capital every year problem because they're committing by buying us to fund us. Um, and uh, or like right out, they take a big loss, but like they're basically committing to fund you. And so uh, that worked out I mean, where I was, it worked out as planned. Um, and so uh, I feel really good about the decision in retrospect. Uh, I think I made it more intuitively at the time than like reasoned. And it only took me a couple of years after doing it to actually even figure out what the math I was, I had been doing subconsciously was, but, uh, but I think it was the right to call for sure. What did Amazon do to keep you around for so long besides just letting you run autonomously? That, or was that it? That, that's, yeah, what, that's literally the thing that they did. I don't, you know, if, Hey, Hey, like, you know, you know, big tech companies, if you want to retain CEOs after you acquire the company, you have to let them still be the CEO, which means they decide who gets hired, who gets fired, what contracts you sign, what products you launch. If you try to take that away from them, make them go through your processes, they're, if they're any good at all as a CEO, they're going to leave because they're not a CEO anymore. They're a division vice president, and that's not the job they signed up for. So FYI, if you want to retain CEOs, one weird trick. What? Uh, but did they get strategic value? I guess to take it from their vantage point, obviously Twitch is a very important asset within there, but the the flip side of, of the reason I think people end up being somewhat heavy handed or, or at least involving themselves post acquisition of a company is to try to 
make the value greater than the individual component of it. Were there things they did from an integration standpoint or, or things that they pushed that benefited other parts of Amazon? Um, I mean, Twitch advertising is sold by Amazon advertising, the third biggest, I think third biggest, I don't know if it's exact, but I think it's the third biggest advertising company in the world. So that's that's good. That's, yeah. that's like, the, like the Instagram, Facebook thing in a way. Um, except for I think we provide more value to Amazon relatively. Facebook already had a lot of ad, ad inventory in feeds that's basically identical, whereas Twitch, Amazon did not have a bunch of UGC video and uh, you know, premium gaming video to like sell against. Yeah, so, that, that's that's them to you. I was wondering you to them if there was anything that. Oh no, I think actually the revert in, in the advertising case, unlike Instagram, where it's mostly Instagram benefiting from the Am- Facebook it, advertising machine. Here, it's much more two way. We open up a new kind of inventory they don't have access to otherwise, which is good for the overall Amazon organization, but also good for Twitch because we get access to the big sales team. So I think the advertising thing is the obvious, just like with Instagram, it's the obvious integration point for something like Twitch. Um, we also do stuff with Prime. That's, that's been very good. That's worked out, which are quite well. Again, very two-way. Um, uh, and we've launched IVS, um, which is our the interactive video service, an AWS service. Um, very cool. Like To be able to take one of the things, core things you built and externalize it as an AWS service is very cool. Um, and something you can't do unless you go to, I guess, it has to be Amazon, Google, or Microsoft, basically, because those are the cloud companies. Um, and we definitely couldn't have done that on our own. Um, but yeah, a lot of it has been less deeply integrated. Um, and I think that that's, except for the points like advertising, which is a really big one, where it does make sense to integrate. And I think it's really to Amazon's credit that they didn't try to force a bunch of integrations for efficiency reasons, um, because if it's always efficient in theory, it's never as efficient as it seems in practice. So, um, uh, I I think strategic. There are strategic acquisitions where you're buying something as a technology. You know, Apple buys some semiconductor company so they can start making chips. Sure, and that should get integrated. It's not. It's not actually a separate product. But if you're buying a product to be part of your portfolio, I actually don't. I think the Often the, integ- it's a, the integrations are a little heavy-handed for no good reason. I've heard you say that as you get money, there's a clear declining value to more money. Uh, obviously, mm-hmm. that's true. It sounds like something people just say. But um, how did how has that actually impacted your life, having success? And how would you internalize yeah. that? Or I mean, ha- having money is great. Um, the you know the utility of money declines approximately with the log of the amount of money. Um, you can actually see it on like, uh, if you, if you plot like, you know, life happiness correlation curves and stuff. So every 10 X more money you have is like one incremental unit more. So like, it's not that there's no value of going from 1 million to 10 million, but it's like 1 million to 10 million is the same as a hundred thousand to a million. And so every going from 1 million to 2 million is like, eh, like it's just not that big of a deal. Um, even though it is a million dollars more, it's like, it doesn't change your life that much. Um, uh, I am very glad to have money um, because it makes my life directly better in terms of consumption, but most of all, because it allows me to do things like invest in, I've invested in my friends' companies or in other, you know, in strangers' companies and people I've met's companies. And that's, you know, being an angel investor is really interesting. And I feel like I get to support people and, and help. Um, I got to fund SF New Deal, uh, right? And like, I got to write a check for a million dollars uh, into SF New Deal uh, because I, I had someone I knew, Lenore, who uh, Lenore Estrada, who was CEO, and I trusted she could step up and run it, and I could make that decision fast and just write the check. Um, I didn't have to go try to raise money from other people or put it together, crowdfunding it, and uh, that was really valuable. I really like stand by that being that was it was and it was interesting. It was it was fun for me, um, and uh, uh, you get to go do think cool things for your friends and your community. So I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess having money is great. Who doesn't like having money? Um, I don't think it's the, it's not the only thing. Um, there's a, the, the quote I like about money is like, you need money. Like you, if you're, it's like you're on a road trip, you need gas. But life, you know, road trips are not tours of gas stations and your life shouldn't be a tour of money making uh, activities. But like, also like you should think about where the gas stations are on your road trip. Like it's, especially if you're going on a long, big one, like you really don't want to run out of gas. 
Uh, over the years, you've been particularly transparent about being a bad manager initially. Uh, I, I, there was a quote you had, I was bad at hard conversations. I was bad at good conversations. I was bad at delegating. I'm sorry to the people that worked for me in the early days. Uh, I assume you're being too hard on yourself there, but what were some of the things you learned about yourself and managing that, uh, allowed you to develop into a good manager? So I would say in the early days, I was a pretty good leader already, but a bad manager. Like I could, I could inspire people with a direction. I could communicate, but I, I was, I, I was stand by what I said there. I was a bad manager, um, but I don't think I'm being particularly harsh. I have yet to meet anyone who is a good manager the first year they are a manager. I don't think anyone is. Uh, being a manager is a set of skills, like a thousand different skills, and the, the you aren't good at them by they're not like things you just know automatically like no one's a good skier the first time they go skiing it is not possible to be good at first um there's only one thing that distinguishes good managers from bad managers consistently that i've found some people when presented with this uh don't like this truth that they suck and decide that they are in fact good managers already or that management is easy or that they don't have, that it's not any they're as good as they, they need to be and some people realize that management is a skill and they're not good at it yet and decide, I, I want to get better at this. I want to learn how to be a better manager. And they, every year they're thinking about how do I get better? How do I, how do I, how can I become a better and more qualified manager? And how can I be better at this set of skills? And the people who try don't always succeed, but fair amount do. Management's not so hard. If you, if you treat it like a set of skills, they're not the hardest skills to learn anywhere. It's not as hard as like, you know, abstract math and inventing like new, uh, uh, you know, new theorems about topology. That's, that is more difficult than management, but it is, it's hard enough. You have to learn the people who dedicate themselves to it often, usually not always become good managers. The people who don't are universally terrible. And that is, that is just the only thing that differentiates the people is like, whether you accept into your heart, you need to learn, you need to get better at this thing. And that's basically it. What was counterintuitive or what, what skills were counterintuitive to you that you, that, that maybe took longer to learn or just were super surprising as you got uh, higher and higher, uh, with more and more people. The thing about management skills is they're all dumb. They don't, they're not surprising. When you say them out loud, they sound stupid. Um, like, uh, when you delegate something to someone, you have to actually delegate it to them. You can't, delegate it and then like look over their shoulder and then tell them they did it wrong. Like that's just going to make them unhappy. Um, and, and, and worse, they're going to stop trying to even do the thing because they know whether they do it well or badly, you're going to show up and then review it and then make it the way you would have done it. And then, and so why should they put much, they just, 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 their whole goal is to get it in front of you so you can correct it. And like, that's obvious if you think about it, it's not like that's a dumb it's almost dumb to get wrong, and almost everyone gets it wrong when they first become a manager. Because it's a little, it, it's I guess it's counterintuitive, but I, I don't even think it's the counterintuitiveness. It's just you don't. Most of management is learning to notice the thousand and one things that you can do wrong, and if you thought about each one of them, you would probably come to the right answer. But you just it just doesn't occur to even notice. Um, I guess the thing that one counterintuitive thing about management that was a surprise to me is that managing individual contributors on a team is not the same job as managing a team of managers, is not the same job as managing a team of managers of managers. It's not the same job as managing a team of directors. It's not the team of, same as managing a team of VPs. And that's not the same as managing a team of SVPs. Every time you add a layer to the company, your job is like, all, it doesn't have nothing in common, but it's fundamentally quite different. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to scale teams and people like sort of uh, hit a scaling limit at some point. It's because as you keep in a fast growing company, everyone's like winding up underwater all the time as you, layers under, you get more layers under them. And that, that director who was doing such a great job is doing a bad job now. They didn't get bad. The job changed from, from underneath them. And so everyone's in this race to like figure out the new job before it uh, before it kills them. What changes in those levels of abstraction? Like, uh, I mean, at a high level, when you're when you're so far removed, what what is so different the, than being on the ground? I would say like uh, the 
you have just the techniques you you have to use techniques that scale better as you get that rather than things that are maximally effective you want things that are scale best and that like the trade off between how effective is this individual interaction how good it how, how like in the beginning you need things you need to actually fix problems and ship code and make things happen um, and that kind of dynamism is really important as you get higher and higher in a in a hierarchy you have to figure out how you can make your time and your effort and your energy scale because you can't go do it thing by thing. And so there's a trade-off between those two things and you uh, uh, you need to pick the, the skills that you need are more of the scale, scale, scale level skills. Um, writing becomes more important when you're higher up in the organization, for example. As you get higher and higher and the company gets bigger and bigger, there's also a component of transparency and input of decisioning that uh, you can't be can't be quite the same as it was in the early days, right? Like the decisions, all the inputs that went into an individual decision, you can't communicate in mass to the totality uh, of the company, which I think can be hard. I think that can be hard when you come from a culture of like full transparency or it was small and now you're big and all that. Did you, did you experience that? Was that something that you struggled with of just like how to balance transparency with just giving people the outputs of stuff? Yeah. I mean, there's, people can f use the word transparency a lot when what they mean is input. Um, you can give transparency for stuff, actually, not everything, but most things, no matter how big you are. Um, a lot of the time, the transparency just makes people more upset, though, because what they really meant when they said they wanted transparency is they wanted a voice. And that you cannot scale. Everyone cannot have a voice on everything. Um, in fact, almost everyone can't have a voice on almost everything. And... Uh, that's not true when you're small. It gets true when you're bigger. Um, when you're small, you can stay very, very synchronized. And as you get bigger, everything has to just desync. Um, and uh, figure creating mechanisms and processes so that the right people can have input at the right time is like that is the art of management and and production in a company of greater size. And like I don't know. There's no there's no short answer to that question. That like is it all meaningful? But uh, I think the the main metaphor I always use for it is like you have to you have to shard the decision making. So like sharding is an idea from programming and from like databases, where you have to find a way that you can divide stuff up such that some set of the of the data of the decisions can be made in this hundred people, and this hundred people in this group owns everything about that, and they don't have to communicate much with the other groups. And figure out how you can bottleneck and shrink those uh, between group communications and, and let people interact in a more asynchronous way. Um, and again, there's a thousand and one techniques for that, but that's what you have to figure out how to do. What was something that you, you found that even after, uh, whatever, 10, 12 years, how long was your run at Twitch? Uh, 17 years. Seven, 17 years from, from Justin TV. Mm -hmm. And what was something that you found that was just you were never going to be particularly good at and that you needed to augment uh, or or get people around you to to help you with? I think I uh, what I discovered is I could be good at literally anything. Um, there was no skill I could not learn. But there were a lot of things where uh, I don't like doing it. I'm never going to enjoy doing it and it's always going to drain energy from my day. And by the end of the day, if I'm doing a bunch of that kind of work, I'm going to be grumpy and unhappy and tired. And people interacting with me are probably not going to have the best experience. Um, and so it was less about what I could get good at. I could get good at almost anything, at least, you know, once. Um, it was more about, like, what could I do sustainably? What, 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 how do I manage my job so that I am doing things sustainably in a way where I am cons can consistently do it at high quality? Uh, when I'm not at my best. Um, and so for me, one of those things is like, I really have never been great at interviewing. I don't like interviewing uh, new candidates for jobs. Um, there's a lot of energy for me to meet a new person and bring bring that their, who they are on and make a connection. And like, I, I like doing it actually, uh, when the, uh, there's someone I find myself naturally drawn to, which is, you know, whatever, one in four people or something. Like, which I, I don't think is unusual 
in terms of the one and four part, I think it's just an unusually high energy cost for me for the other three. And I can do it and I've learned how to do it and I've, but I don't like doing it. And so I've just found ways for that. I was not the first person. I, I had this heroic idea, like hiring is super important. I need to be the only one out there, you know, interviewing for the new CFO um, or the new, you know, head of product or whatever. That turned out to be a terrible idea. I was grumpy all the time if I did that. Um, and instead, the right thing for me to do was uh, let other people do most of the interviewing and only interview, you know, two or three final candidates. Um, and you're just sort of admitting that you don't have to like all the all the work you do. You, you tweeted recently management lessons from the front number uh, seven six one. I don't. I didn't go back to look if there were actually seven hundred sixty before of the in front of them. But or your reports will ask you a lot of stuff, especially in the beginning. Like should we do X or Y? Do not be tricked. This is usually un usually unintentional trap. The only correct response is what What do you recommend? Does that tie back to the autonomy of decisioning and being able to delegate? Yeah. If you and this is this is not to say that you should never answer your report's questions. I want to be really clear. Uh, some people interpreted me as saying uh, in that uh, you should, uh, when, when, if you tell the report, like, uh, you, you tell, you, 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 if you tell someone like, uh, uh, you know, Hey, go, go make this thing, go build this thing. And they come back and say, Oh, well, there's this trade off that's above my pay grade. Uh, you know, the company, we I have to commit the company to $20 million of liability, or we have to spend an extra 16 weeks doing this. And I kind of think we should actually commit to the liability, but like, what do you think? That's a fair question. That is not, that is not, uh, uh, it's not their job to figure out, uh, you know, some individual contributor, you know, uh, new person on the marketing team is not the company's job to figure out, should we run this level of risk? No, no, uh, fair. And those often get kicked up the chain and that kind of taking on of risk sometimes requires all the way up to the CEO to sign off. Totally reasonable. But when you ask someone like, hey, like, uh, like you know, they're designing a new a new ad campaign. If they come to you and they say like, oh, well, do you think we should make the ad campaign's message this message or that message? That is literally the, your, that's the job of the person who's you asked to go, you know, should we use this creative approach or that creative approach? I don't know, you, it's your ad campaign. Like you tell me, um, because if you don't do that, n they don't own the decision. Um, and the whole point is to delegate down both the authority to make the decision and the accountability for the results of that decision. Um, and in very dysfunctional companies, sometimes uh, people people have learned you they actually don't have the actually have the authority no matter what anyone tells them. And that means they don't want the accountability. And you end up with this entire this circle of them very logically constantly trying to push off accountability by getting input and making sure other, everyone is signed off and they never have to make a decision to take any risk. And that's because they know they don't actually have the authority and they don't really believe they'll be allowed to do a good job. Um, and I, I have empathy for people who are stuck in that situation. It happens in, even in good companies. It happens sometimes. Uh, but the, the good solution is not then get everyone to sign off on everything so it's all safe, but rather then actually empower people to make decisions so it so that they you can actually just do stuff. You did a great YC talk uh, with regard to product development um, about how to think about developing product when talking to your users and customers, users and customers of competing services, as well as other people that aren't using your product uh, today. We touched on product development a little bit and the three pillars that you guys kind of use to think about. Um, how do you think about, I guess now it's probably been 10 years or eight years since you did that talk. Mm -hmm. How do you think about product development and actually figuring out the features that matter at, at a zoomed out level, maybe not Twitch specifically, but just like, how do you make these prioritizations? So the, the uh, saying that comes to mind for me for this is um, planning is essential. Plans are useless. Um, I think it's like a, like Eisenhower or something, some, some general. Um, and it's totally correct because you, if you don't make a plan for how you're going to get you know, from point A to point B, you're going to miss so much stuff and you're, you're going to fail. But once you make the plan, no plan survives contact with the enemy. As soon as you start executing, you realize like, oh, that didn't actually work. This didn't actually work. And you have to, you have to improvise. 
Um, talking to customers is essential, um, but the results of talking to customers is useless. Like it is the talking to the customers and the really paying attention that informs your intuition that then lets you design the product. You're not you're not delegating. The mistake people make is they're trying to delegate product design to the customer. And if they were so good at the product design, they would be starting the company. They would be the product manager. They're not good at product design. They know what problems they're running into. They know the realities of their business. And what you need to do is you need to understand them incredibly deeply, not get them to do your job for you. Sort of almost the inverse of the manager situation. Don't delegate that to them. Um, the, this, that's one, one direction you make the mistake is you try to delegate the product design to the customer. No, no, no. You design the product. You talk to them. You get you understand them and you use that to design the product. The other side of it is you have this, you come up with a great idea and you go to talk to customers to validate it. Validate is the like, uh, when I hear people talk about validating product ideas, I, uh, I instantly know that there is a, there's a problem um, because once you've had the idea, no amount of talking to any number of customers will change how good of an idea that was. It is exactly as good as it is the moment you have it. And you could have a thousand customers tell you it's a great idea. It was or was not, and it will, a great idea, and it will or will not have the impact before they've told you or after told you. If a thousand customers tell you it's a bad idea, same thing, doesn't change anything. And so unless you are actually throwing away lots of ideas, customers tell you they don't like them, you're not having any impact at all. And so that most, and I've also just, I, that never happens. Every now and then people validate ideas and throw them away. And actually what's even funnier there is it's usually when they do actually throw them away, those ideas might've been good. The customers are just bad product designers and they don't realize that actually is a good solution to their problem. But um, the, uh, the main thing is the order is wrong. You need to talk to customers uh, first and then have your great ideas. And so like, there's this uh, idea from the rationalist community online uh, that are really like hold, holding off on proposing solutions. Um, holding off on proposing solutions is one of the key product design skills because you have to like know there's a problem and not come up with the solution long enough to actually go like gather some data and think about it. Um, because once you come up with a solution, you're, it's actually your, your brain just like attaches to it. It's really hard to like let go. Some people can do it, but it's, it's surprisingly difficult. There's a, uh, I want to talk about more about decisioning and one as it relates to um, when you had four co-founders, Kyle, Michael, Justin, and yourself in a mm -hmm. room, you mentioned there was ultimately kind of a war of attrition on decisioning <laughs> that uh, it was whoever was last man standing kind of got the, got the vote. We had a real, we had a real hybrid model. So we, we would, we would have uh, these like epic debates which were mostly useless. And sometimes we would do the thing of like the person who like had the most stamina, but often it was just like, there's this other thing happening, which is like whoever just did stuff, they got their way too. Like uh, that was Kyle's main move, but actually it was my move and a lot Michael's move too. Like we'd, we'd argue about it and then we'd, uh, we'd go off and like all just like do stuff. And actually I would say in retrospect, it's a little bit of the planning is essential plans are useless thing. We could, the arguments could have been less contentious. And we could have probably shortened the debates, but they were valuable. And we would we would game it out. We would argue it out extensively. We would hear from all the sides. And the person who was in charge of that would go make a decision and make stuff happen. And actually, that's actually, in retrospect, a relatively functional process um, because there was a distribution of authority and accountability. Although it, it maybe was an unpleasant, it was an unpleasant but kind of effective approach. And I would say it was like a high-end, pleasant, medium effective. I wouldn't really recommend it as a, you can do better. There's more Pareto optimal outcomes, but like, but it's better than the stuff that's ineffective. One, one question on, uh, I guess, just cause it's been a big debate, uh, of late is the remote work thing. And now having lived through 
Justin TV and Twitch and seeing all the discourse online. You're, uh, uh, you're working with Y Combinator now. Like what's your, what's your perspective on remote work and decisioning? Yeah, that specific mm-hmm. question, I guess you had tweeted out my observation. You can build a two by two for workplace environments, remote, local, and hierarchical versus egalitarian. There is an island of stability out and deep and remote and hierarchical. Uh, what did you mean by that? And what's your perspective on remote? So, um, the island of stability is an idea from like the periodic table where like as hell elements get heavier and heavier, they become unstable, but there's a theorized, we've yet to synthesize one of these elements is a theorized island of stability way out at like a very high neutron proton count where suddenly the elements get stable again for a little bit. Um, uh, but there's like, but in be- if the in-between options are all bad, um, and, and are unstable and intensely radioactive. Um, and I, I've seen, I, I know a couple companies that are very effective remote. And what differs, what, the way they differ from the traditional Valley culture is it's not uh, distribution of authority. Everybody like, you know, is aut- aut- autonomy. Everyone like figure out what to do on their own. It's like the army. Like there's, there's delegation. There's delegation of authority, but it's not this delegation of authority and distribution of authority are not the same. And uh, they are all over auditing and follow-up and interactions and documentation and you have to document your work and you submit it and you can you can build uh, a mechanism in a culture that works remote um but the valley approach i think it's like, i think of it kind of like canonically in its most extreme of like the google vibe of like yeah like no real accountability like directly like because we don't really know what's good and like go experiment and try stuff and like maybe it'll work and like no real urgency to like launch stuff fast that that does not work remote it works okay in person because there's sort of this weird implicit social pressure thing that gets used in place of official uh meth- methods to like manage stuff but once you take that away and you don't have the official thing either it's just like bad uh and so there's the silicon the, the valley culture works there's a reason why like silicon valley has taken over like you know the it didn't evolve for no reason, but you can't take that culture and transplant it into a remote work environment and expect it to work. Um, and I think we'll slowly sort of like, you'll start to see models that are like, oh, you're on this model, you're on the this model, or you're on the that model. Um, uh, and I think that that will, uh, uh, I think that will, that'll be good for us actually. Well, they'll, they'll, if you really care a lot about remote, you'll go work at a company that has a remote culture that works. Um, I actually like love the in-office thing. Uh, I love being able to be remote sometimes, but like, uh, I just, enjoy, I enjoy being around my coworkers. I enjoy being able to see them in the face. I like the organic parts of it. Um, but I know not everybody does. Um, and I'm really happy that they get to go work at a remote environment that hopefully has a functional, not dysfunctional remote culture. Goals and OKRs versus intentions you prefer to focus on intentions than OKRs rather than being tied to specific goals. Can, can you elaborate on that? I mean, that's, that's more on a personal basis than on a, on a corporate Company, basis, corporate. like at a, at a corporate basis, go- goals are very important. Like you need to actually setting goals is a, I could probably give an entire hour long talk on like setting goals and the trade-offs and various ways to do that. But, uh, at an individual level, um, setting goals for yourself can be fun. But ultimately, goals are usually a way to coerce yourself or whip yourself into doing a thing you don't want to do. You should have set a goal. And like that's why you need them in the corporate environment. People have to sometimes be a little bit coerced into doing something that's less than the thing that they want to actually do. But it's important to the company, even though it's not the most interesting and exciting to them personally. And you're trying to artificial excitement and fun. It can, also, it can be inspiring. It can be exciting to try to hit a goal, too. It doesn't have to be always a whip. There's a carrot there, too. But even carrots are coercion. Like, ultimately... It's not the intrinsic thing itself. You're 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 using reward or punishment, like a operative conditioning on a dog to get it to train it to do what you want. And there's a place for that, but like, I try not to like coerce myself all the time. Um, and I find that uh, an overfocus on goals, like goals, are set with your intellectual, like top-down analytical mind. And if you're good at setting them, you can be effective with it. But like. Your analytical, your like top analytical mind is only so good, and it's easy to set a goal that is not it. It's like related to what you wanted to do, but not quite what you actually wanted to do. And 
then you, that's very dangerous because you can spend years sometimes pursuing this and achieving and succeeding only to find out, oops, I didn't actually, that goal was, that was like sort of right, but it missed this important thing. And now I'm like, I have to actually go way back and start over. Um, and so I mostly think about it in terms of like, uh, you know, to make a really concrete one, like don't set a weight loss goal, uh, set an intention about uh, wanting to be strong and healthy and acting in accordance with that um, and f- creating an infrastructure to support you in doing that well. Um, this is, the book I think about on this a lot is The Score Takes Care of Itself. By um, Walsh. Yeah, by Walsh. That's, that, that, that book's great. Um, and I think it really, it's for the people who haven't read it, it's the idea of like what you, the score in the game is literally irrelevant. He's a football coach. And you ignore the score. Score, it's like, screw that. Like, uh, uh, what's important is, did you practice? Did you do the practice you needed to do? Did you sh- everyone show up to practice? They give, did they give practice their all? And if they, if you, they did that, you're gonna win or lose the game. That will, that that will take care of itself. And I find that's very true for for goal setting. Um, the goals tend to focus you on the score. And, or creating a score, you're you're trying to create a way to score yourself, and that's not necessarily the best way to do it. I I, I don't know if we have an hour to do the uh, the setting goals for a company thing, but is there a short primer on how you think about setting goals or OKRs for companies? Uh, no. <laughs> like, uh, let me see. Some goal. Do I have any maxims about goals? Um, Obviously, it sounds like focusing on inputs versus outputs is... Uh... No, you need a blend of input and output goals because the output goals keep you honest and the input goals keep you focused. Uh, I'd say... Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of goals you set for different kinds of reasons. And the most important thing is to be kind of clear with yourself. So like one goal I set for Twitch was like, I want us to have a million people earning money on Twitch in five years. 2016... I set a goal we had like at the time, I think 15,000 people earning money, 10,000, something like that. And I was like, I think it was 10,000. And I set a goal. I want to have a million people earning money on Twitch by the end of 2021. And we hit it because of COVID. We hit it actually early 2021, uh, which I'm very proud of. We I called that w- weirdly accurate, but I didn't really call it. I, I uh, God, I sound like a hippie. Like I manifested it, right? Like by just saying that to the company and having people think about that, uh, it generated things like other people inventing things like the affiliate program. Well, if we're going to have a million people earning money, we have to have a really easy way for people to sign up to earn money. And so we created the affiliate program and like the, and then a bunch of other things like that. Right. Um, and that's one kind of goal. That's like a five year goal. That's like, it, I had no idea how to achieve. It was very output oriented and supposed to be sort of in, an inspirational goal. But then you also set goals like, you know, this quarter we need to get our, uh, you know, the number of TPS reports filed up by 17%. And those goals can be very effective and important also. Um, you know, and I, I think it's like, uh, uh, it's the, they are useful for different things. They're motivating to different people in different contexts and you should just not confuse each of the goals for each other. I know you're a big believer in coaches and that a coach will pay for itself as soon as you can afford it. I guess maybe can you tell the story of your coach and then ultimately why you think it's important, how you go about assessing a mentor or a coach along the way? Yeah, I think I got very lucky. So, I, you know, with my coach, uh, he was uh, uh, introduced to me uh, by Stuart Alsop, uh, who's our, uh, on, our, on our board. Um, the, yeah, and it was our first in, you know, VC investment. Um, and... Uh, when I became CEO shortly after, he uh, he recommended I start working with Yosi. Um, and I said, all right, I'll give that a try. Um, and uh, I was honestly a little skeptical at first, but I was like, uh, I guess I took getting better at being a CEO very seriously. And if this thing could help, I wanted to give it a, give it a shot. Um, and Yosi has had taken his previous company public um, and had been a CEO before. And then he pivoted into wanting to do coaching. And I feel very lucky I got someone who had that level of background because I think it's very hard to coach a, C- a CEO if you haven't lived 
seen, been part of that. I don't know if you had to be a CEO exactly, but if you haven't at least been an executive or you know, a board member, or so, if you haven't been part of those decisions, it's hard to give to do good coaching. Um, coaching is valuable because it, it creates a space where you, you uh, get to have someone who has no incentive other than helping you hold a mirror up for you to what you're saying, what you're doing, what your goals are and helping you and what your intentions are and helping you live more in accordance with those and notice what you're doing better, what you're doing worse. And there's a bit of coaching where it's like literally just advice, like, uh, uh, you know, how, how, what, what are the, what are tactical tricks to handle this given situation? But honestly, like, that's like the, the less important side of, of coaching and mentorship. The more important side is like, you're almost, uh, you're learning the questions they ask and you're learning to ask their questions of yourself consistently. Um, the, you know, you have a coach that is, you, you have to really, I think the, the way to think about coaching is sort of like uh, find, selecting a good coach, a little bit selecting a good therapist or selecting a good, um, you know, a good partner or something on a, on a startup, a good co-founder. You know it's working when you have more like positive surprises than negative ones. You know it wor it's working when you feel you, it, you're growing, you're, you know, the things you learned there, you find yourself repeating to other people. Um, and, uh, and so I, I definitely recommend it, but I also think that a lot of coaches aren't that good. And so like, there's a process of looking and selecting. How, how do you go about assessing the relationship and make, is it just, are you I, getting, I'm a, the it? worst person to ask. I got very lucky. Yeah, I got someone one great for one. on, I got, I'm one for one. I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's yeah. like people who like, met their sweetheart, yeah. high school sweetheart, Middle and they were like school. the yeah. person for them. And it's just, it's great. And they're deliriously happy with that person 30 years later. It's like, that's amazing for you, but like not an actionable plan for anyone else. Yeah, yeah. hard to extrapolate. Yeah. yeah. So I actually, have, I have, you know, you need, to, I have great advice about how to go about learning how to build product because I sucked at it. And I, had to, I, I, I didn't get it right a bunch of times. You know, I actually think that you know, Drew, I love Drew, but I bet he gives bad advice to startups about how to, go about finding your very first glimmers of product market fit because he happened to build the right thing. Drew Housen. Drew Housen, yeah, yeah. He, Drew managed to build the right product just like directly. He just directly somehow, I think he's very obviously very good at product, but like he just did it. Oh, yeah. Nobody does that. Like, that's, what I, that's what I feel but, about Twitter today. It's yeah, yeah. like, it's you like can't, they you can't give that advice. Yeah, yeah you, can't, you can't advise anyone if you've done, like that's, you don't know how to, figure how to get from failure to success because you never spent any time in failure. Yeah. Um, Drew has a lot of great advice about scaling a company uh, because he's had the struggle with that. I want to go back in time. So you were a part of the first original YC batch, which also was Steve Huffman, Alexis Ohanian of Reddit, uh, Sam Altman as well. As you look back on the success of the group of people uh, that came out of that, how much do you put that just the people innately, the insights and lessons learned, right place, right time, some other variable I'm not thinking about. I mean, I certainly think, you know, I have to, we all have to credit Paul with like being a kind of a mentor to all of us. Um, and like really, I do think, you know, leveling us all up a little bit. Like I, I, I absolutely don't think it's a coincidence, but I also think and this is true of YC today. It's true of every elite university it's selection effects is some, it's like this massive part of it. And it's not just, it's not that so much that YC was some brilliant filterer that filtered out the best people. It's like, who thought in 2005, remember in 2005 when I graduated, it was the smallest computer science class that Yale had graduated in years because uh, the tech, the tech was over. Anyone who was like reading Paul Graham's essays thought it was a good idea to start a startup in 2005, thought it was a good idea to go take a risk on a thing like YC like th that seemed like the, the, it drew in people who turned it would turn out that that was a uh, a good like trap for people who turned out to be uh ambitious and talented and a good vintage to be starting companies and it was great we, it was it was very counter uh narrative which is always the best time to be starting right we were, we were, we were starting at the bottom and so yeah yc classes of like 05 06 07 particularly like before the density is a little higher I don't know if that's actually true. Like, density is pretty high later too, but like, it certainly pulls in a lot of 
uh, it pulled in a lot of uh, very talented people because uh, it was it wasn't prestigious yet. So you only did it if you were like really committed to wanting to do a startup, because even though that sounded like even though everyone was telling you it was a bad idea to do that, um, and I think that's like uh, uh, that's actually always still the best reason to start a startup. Um, fortunately, starting a startup is so painful that mostly that people still do it. Unlike a lot of things that people do for fun, uh, because they're supposed to, starting a startup is so painful that most people just select out correctly. Um, because unless you like buying your pain economy size, I don't really recommend it. <laughs> what what did what did Paul do uniquely well in those early days? I mean, the whole institution he started has obviously lasted and been. But Paul, Paul's super superpower, by far his superpower. Like he's Paul's very smart, good at a lot of things, but his, by far his superpower is you somehow walk away. Is everyone? This is me, me, but also Justin, and also everyone else I talked to inside of YC. You somehow walk away from the conversation with Paul believing we are the shit. We are smart, capable, and we're going to take over the world. And the only thing standing between us and taking over the world is we have to like go grind even harder. We, but like Paul believes in us, but it's not like, what's happening is like he, Paul is, Paul believes in you. So you believe in yourself, but it's not actually somehow he doesn't, it doesn't feel like Paul believes in me. It feels like Paul just sees that I'm obviously extremely talented and capable and like i mean i'm just i'm the, the only issue is maybe i'm aiming too small should we be aiming bigger but it feels like he's just noticed this fact that now you can see too and that is such a gift to be able to give to people because i think i think that did what it gave us was the most important thing that startup founders need and i think that anyone doing anything ambitious needs which is the like gumption to keep going when things aren't looking so hot midway through uh and paul really convey like paul's that's that paul gives that to people and i think that's like that is by far his his greatest talent which is which is funny because he has a lot of other talents but like that's uh that's a big one so so it was you uh, alexis uh uh steve huffman paul like was it uh, sam altman was it obvious at that point in time that something special was in the room or was it hey I, I, we're in the room with these oh, no, people no no absolutely not i mean yes in the sense that like i thought everyone seemed smart and good but and and like but you're coming from yale and i'm sure there's yeah, there, good I, people there too yeah and and i and i i've been in several elite programs in my life that where there's other smart people uh i i had that sense more of like joining tech in san francisco at that time like in Boston and Cambridge, not really. When we moved to San Francisco, it was like, oh, oh, I'm in the middle of like ground zero of something. Um, and it actually it wasn't the first batch. The first batch was just like some weird summer program. But when the batches kept getting bigger and I would meet the new founders and like more companies and they had a building with a bunch of everyone's in the, and like, it's like, oh, oh, well, this is something, the thing is happening around me. That became very clear by like 2000, by early 2007, Absolutely. But at first, no, it was just, just, it just seemed like a thing. It was cool. I was really grateful. I got to do, got to raise money and like start a company. and didn't have to go like live with my parents to like start in, in their basement. Was it obvious Sam was going to be the leader of the free world? Uh, no, it was obvious. Sam was an incredible deals guy. Like he was, he was con somehow convincing the uh, phone companies to give him his startup that like didn't really have a product like, deals i like, still don't know how he did that and like he's doing the same thing like convincing microsoft to like you know buy his fusion power like sam is still an inc incredible deals guy obviously uh but that that was that that was the only obvious thing about sam at the time was like that he was amb he was ambitious but we had most of us were pretty ambitious and he was great at great great deals guy you said something interesting once the only reason you ask about tam is to understand the ambitions of the founder uh, can you tell me why why you think that why why you approach investing in that way or why you approach thinking about TAM in that way? What what was the TAM of uh, live reality television? Uh, whatever Justin was willing to pay you at yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah, like nothing basically. Yeah. Um, and yet that's pretty big. Live streaming shows a pretty pretty big business. Um, I ask people about TAM a lot, and I, I'll push them on it, but it's like it's because. 
what you're trying to figure out is, do they have a story that might have a lot of holes in it and like, or like questionable assumptions where like they're trying to build something really great and big? Or do they have a story that's like, oh yeah, yeah, I will, no, the, don't worry about the TAM. We're just going to flip this to Google uh, in two years once we hire the talent. Like, that's a really bad sign. Companies don't get built by people who, who are looking for the exit. You want people who are looking to build something big, something great. Um, because to even build something medium sized, you have to be trying to build something really great. And if you're if you don't if you're not if you're aiming for the aqua hire, you're probably not even going to get that. Um, and uh, and so it's a very important question. But the point is not to like that you can actually analyze the TAM per se. And I think that's a it's a little different. For more established founders, especially, it's a little different in places where there's more, you need more commitment up front, more capital up front to get going. Because well, the other thing I look for is I, there's founders who, there's this trap you can wind up in where you, you start, is, your, is the, if you're building for a customer that doesn't exist or like that hates buying software or that like doesn't want to, doesn't want any, anything to do with this whole thing, that's bad. So like, I don't care if your thing credibly, you know, is in, is every developer on earth is actually going to use your product, but building software for developers is a good plan. There are a lot of developers and they spend a lot of money on software. And so even if you're wrong about your exact thing, it's going to be okay. Like the software developer market is big. If you're building market for software, that's like really for public school librarians, and that's the only people and you're like, and I'm pushing you on like, no, but isn't this bigger than that? And you're like, no, no, it's for public school librarians. I'm really worried for you because even if you like crush it, that's not actually, they don't, nothing wrong with librarians. They don't even buy, they don't like buying software in the first place and there aren't that many of them. So like, that's maybe not a great idea. And so like, and, and, and founders can kind of get trapped in these ideas where they're building okay businesses targeted at very small groups of people who don't want to buy their product. Um, and so it's more about your, just in theory, if you executed like crazy and figured out six things that we didn't even think of in this room on a pivoted idea that's like halfway, only halfway connected to your idea, would that be a big business? Yeah. No? Okay, maybe maybe we should change ideas. Yeah. Uh, there's two options for companies. You can either be, generally, you can either be early or late. Uh, and I, I get the feeling being early is probably better. How do you think about timing a timing a market and making sure that you're there to ride that wave and the differences between being too early and too late? Your every startup that wins pretty much, not everyone, but like 98% uh, is too early. Because if you're not too early, you're usually too late. Because if you think about it, you're trying to like there, there is some optimal day like literally, there's probably a day where like, start if you start the company on this day, everything will be available as you need it. The, there will be sufficient bandwidth to do your idea. There'll be sufficient this to, you know, the monetization techniques will work. The distribution will be in place. But if you start it on that day, someone else, when everything actually be, becomes available, everyone else, someone else will have started it a year earlier, stupidly, just by random chance, because every idea is getting started over and over again. And they will be in motion and they will have infrastructure and they will have a product built and suddenly their product will be working and you will be too late. And so what you're trying to do is like, so if you think about it for, for Justin TV, we were too early. Bandwidth was too expensive to make our business work. Uh, and almost honestly, most people couldn't even watch, didn't have good advantage to even watch reasonably qual quality live video. And the video ad market didn't exist. We didn't have a business. It was impossible. But we, but but there were other startups that tried to compete with us, several that started later. And they just got destroyed because we'd built global live video infrastructure for the past four years and they hadn't. And so, you know, from when the start gun went off on like, oh no, no, the business works now. There's just, how do you catch up with someone with a four year head start still led by the founder CEO, still like grinding super hard, trying to make it work. Like you're just screwed. Um, and so a big part of it is if you if you have faith that your thing is going to work and the pieces are going to come into place, the question for startups is how do you survive? That's why you read so much about like YC's advice is like be a cockroach. Like don't don't 
don't be a, uh, a graceful swallow, be a cockroach because you're usually too early and you just have to survive and survive until it's a combination of like you find the secret thing, but often it's actually like you didn't change anything. The market caught up with the future that you saw that you can't ever time exactly right. And suddenly your thing that wasn't good is good and boom. Like Airbnb is a good example of that actually, I think. Like they they had a product and yes, they did iterate and they did figure stuff out, but like a big part of it was like people got comfortable with the idea of like host listing stuff on the internet and renting through uh renting other people's stuff. Uh and and a business that didn't work and wasn't good became a business that did work and became and was good. And I think that's a it's a very common pattern. Talking about cockroaches, and you guys were certainly that with Justin TV, um, frugality uh, being something that's important, but maybe not a virtue, uh, that that being able to use frugality, I, I've written down here, I assume you said it because it's in quotes, frugality isn't a virtue in itself, speed is. How do you think about the balance of, of speed and frugality and the ability to execute the other thing I think you said the blast radius of startups is low which is to your advantage as a startup yeah I mean frugality for uh, Amazon one of Amazon's core uh, like like Amazon Amazon's Twitch the uh, Amazon's leadership principles the ALP um, one of them is frugality um, it's about how leaders should be frugal and inside of Amazon there's a saying about like yeah yeah frugality but don't you don't wanna, oh you need to avoid frupidity um, because frugality and frupidity are near and far aligned. Um, because you need to be willing to spend money and, and to invest for something that's important to do something. But also, but wasting money is very bad. And the difference between one man's investment is one man's waste is another man's investment, and vice versa. The real thing that kills startups in terms of spending money is usually not overspending on like bandwidth or like server capacity or like even marketing. Obviously, don't run marketing. It doesn't work. It's inefficient. But like what uh, what kills startups is hiring. You hire too many people. And that does kill you because you have this high burn rate and eventually you run out of money and the burn rate kills you. But it also kills you because more people means more slow. Um, and speed is the essence. And like hiring is not in alignment with speed. <laughs> um, speed is in alignment with speed. And so there is a point where you do need to hire more people to go faster. But like it is later than people think. It's less hiring than people think. Um, and so I think a lot of the advice to get about to startups about for frugality is really better framed as advice about you need to be going fast. And that means don't grow your team too much. That creates a lot of drag. What what drew you back to YC as a as a partner now? Like what was, I mean, you were at Amazon yeah. for a long time. What made you want to go oh, back? I've, I've always wanted to be a YC partner. Like I, uh, I don't know if it's like my forever job, but like, I watched my friends go through it. I love advising startups. And I was like, oh, that looks fun. I want to try that. And so I just always had the intention of going and doing YC for a year as a partner. Um, just honestly, because it's like a life experience. And I'm really enjoying it so far. Uh, I think there's a chance I do it more ongoing. But I also have, am enjoying like having a little bit more freedom post not being a CEO. And the job, it's a real job at YC. Like, you know, it's not not like being a CEO of a 2,000 person company, but like, it's a job. Um, and so we'll see if it's like the long term thing. But no, I just always wanted to. And then once I was free, I was like, oh, well, there's a batch coming up. I guess I could go do that. And so it's more of almost more of an impulse thing, less than like a, I have some like plan of wanting to do it. What, what do you think's allowed the institution to survive in the way that, that it has? Uh, it's obviously scaled quite a bit over the years. Um, I mean, YC is like a, uh, a little bit like a university. Yeah. Uh, and like universities, it has a very strong network effect. The smart people want to hang out with some other smart people and want to be at the place where the other smart people are. And that like creates a positive feedback cycle that allows it to scale and, and grow. Um, it makes it hard to, Harvard was the first university in America, weirdly still the most prestigious. That's weird. Like I think Yale was the second university founded in America, second or third most prestigious. Like that's weird. Uh, uh, I think that exact same dynamic happens here. And like, it's not a, and unlike the universities, YC is designed to, sc and can scale up a lot more. And so there's the second place gets, is a little bit smaller um, because people can move around more, much more easily now, right? If, if, uh, if Harvard had been founded in the era where anyone could have flown anywhere 
and had an attitude of scale as much as they, possible, it's not clear there is university two, three, four immediately. Um, and I think YC has been sustained because it's it's always had a long term mindset. Like I remember Paul telling me, like saying, like year two or three in, our biggest advantage in the long run is going to be our alumni, the alumni network. That's what YC is really building, and they call them alumni, right? It's not that's that's a different attitude, um, and uh, and so he was thinking that far ahead at the hmm. at the beginning. I had another question about YC, and I oh, what do you? What do you think the biggest constraint on startups today, the reason that we don't have uh, 10 more Stripes or 100 more Twitches or 30 more uh, Airbnbs, is it because is it, is so, it founders? Is it ideas? Is it capital? Su- sufficiently talented people who, who want to take on the pain of starting a company. Yeah. Like pretty much exclusively. There's lots of capital available. Um, I will say there's, there's, a, uh, there's definitely... A, a missing there's like a missing there are a few missing gears in that process of like there are people who should get access to the capital and if they did they would be successful and it's not that there isn't enough capital there's plenty of capital there's more than enough capital but like there's lots of people who think they should have the capital many of them are wrong some of them are right and the system is like pretty efficient but there's definitely some number of people who like just don't get funded and they should because they because they're bad at pitching because they don't present because the, because on the surface it looks looks wrong because because they 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 can't show you that they should get the funding um and i think that's a shame and like you know, one of yc's mission is to sort of find and fund those people we can't do it perfectly were you were you bad at pitching or did you just hate it I was okay. Yeah. I wasn't great. Um, I would be a lot better at pitching now, and I think I would enjoy it more. Uh, weirdly, at Twitch, after we sold, I, uh, I got to practice sales a lot around with the game co- game companies and, and, and advertising. And I and also, I started investing. And I... Uh, there's no way to do this, but like, if I could give every, every founder a super I'd have them like go be an investor for two years... And then go pitch their company because it's suddenly I'm like oh I see what I was doing wrong, like now I know that I'm sitting on the other side of the table I'm like oh oh no wonder that person like passed my startup I was I was explaining it all wrong I didn't understand their incentives I didn't understand how they saw the world and so the most important thing you can do is a like I wonder if this would work if I was at, if I was to go back and give earlier Emmett advice on like how to pitch better what I would tell him to do is like go find some VC who you're friends with who like sees good companies and be like. I will give do some due diligence for you for free if you let me sit in on like, you know, a month of pitches and hear the discussion afterwards. Because I think I would have been like, oh, I know how to, I know how to do this. Yeah. I, I would have figured out how to pattern match. Like, the problem is like startup founders have only, usually have only seen their pitch. How do you get good at something that you've only, you've only seen your performance at? You don't know what good looks like. Um, and I think that's the, so yeah, that, that's if that's what I would that's what I would tell my prior, prior self to go do. The information's gotten so much better uh, about VC. I mean, one of the things I I, I want to do is try to uh, sort of give elements of how I think or we think and operating. But the, the pitches, it's it's almost a voodoo yeah. science in and of itself. Are there specific things that you learned in pitching the EA or whatever that you would? There's um, there's things you can write down that people have written down a thousand times, like you know templates and stuff sure they're all wrong and they're all bad actually you temp pitch templates whether they're pitches for vc money or for like product things templates are the enemy there's certain like aspects you can do but every pitch is unique because if it wasn't unique you don't have any unique insight like your company is unique there's a there are generalizable principles and rules but there's no template you can go off of and so and yet you know it when you see it and there's like there's there there is there is a I think pitching is one of those things where it's uh, it's very much metis, if you know that idea, the idea yeah. of like uh, skill that you learn through organic doing. N- there is no training for pitching that would be more effective than just like watching a bunch of pitches and then the honest, brutal discussion afterwards about like whether they think that's a good idea or not and participating in that. Um, 
And unfortunately, I don't think anyone's brave enough to put. There's no. I don't know how the. You want to create a piece of content that would be like incredibly valuable to founders in order to pitch. Record three months of every every partner pitch and every pre partner pitch for every company and the discussion afterwards and the decision and publish that. And like then edit it down so like you know, cut out the dead time, edit it down and just have people watch that as a as a uh, as a uh, uh, as a course. That would work. Like people would get a lot better at pitching. Um, unfortunately, I don't think the companies would like that. I think the partners would be really be awkward. But like. So you need to create some system like that um, because that's the that's the only way to get. It's like trying to learn how to like cook from a cookbook. You learn to cook in a kitchen. You don't learn to pitch watching a YouTube video. You learn to pitch from a PowerPoint. You learn to pitch in the in the pitching room. That's interesting. Uh, shifting gears, artificial intelligence. Um, I get the feeling you might have some concerns about the path we're on and some elements of how things are playing out. Is that I mean, fair? so I guess I have I have a very specific concern about AI. Like generally, I'm a, I'm very pro technology, and I really believe in the sort of like uh, the upsides usually outweigh the downsides. Every technology can be misused. You should usually wait, and you should wait until you eventually, as we understand it better you want to put in regulations, but like regulating early is usually a mistake. Um, when you do do regulation, you want to do making regulations that are about uh, reducing risk and in, in, for uh, innovation and actually uh, authorizing more innovation. Innovation is usually good for us. Um, I sort of have a, a, very, a very high level like syllogism about like, like AI that I, I've come to believe that I think is like correct, which is like if we can build if you consider intelligence to be the capacity to solve problems from a given set of resources to a given goal, we are building things that are more and more intelligent. Like the, the we've built an intelligence. It's kind of amazing, actually. We built this on the, like definably. It's, it may not be the smartest intelligence, but it is an intelligence. It can solve problems. So we built something that can solve problems, like arbitrary problems from arbitrary resources, and make arbitrary plans. At some point, as it gets better. The kinds of problems that we'll be able to insult, solve will include uh, programming, chip design, material science, uh, power production, um, all of the things you would need to design an artificial intelligence. At that point, you will be able to point the thing we've built back at itself. And this will happen in, before you get that point with humans in the loop. It already, it already is happening with humans in the loop. But that loop will get tighter and tighter and tighter and faster and faster and faster until it can fully self-improve itself, at which point it will get very fast, very quickly. And a thing that is very, very, very smart, it, and you generate something that is very good, very intelligent. And by intelligent, again, I mean this capacity to solve problems. There's people, there's lots of ways people, that's, it's, a, it's an English word, which means it has no one definition. But I have that, in that sense, I mean, that kind of intelligence. And that kind of intelligence is just an intrinsically very dangerous thing because intelligence is power. Human beings are the dominant form of life on this planet pretty much entirely because we are more and smarter than the other creatures. When was the last time intelligence came into, a, you right. know, a entity and, at this level? Right. And within humans, I think people get confused between these two different things. Within the band of human intelligence, intelligence is not the most important thing. Humans have a lot of other attributes. But intelligence is a very important thing for people. We have but a lot of other... Gorillas are more intimidating as a right. uh, species than, yes. than we are. But That's gorillas right. did not build this right. yeah. studio. And humans are, like, humans are dangerous as hunters, for example, because we're smart. We do things like, you know, crowd the woolly mammoths off cliffs and set traps. And, like, uh, uh, human, we have, we have whites in our irises. It's the exact balance uh, of white to color uh, is what communicates what we're looking at. Other primates have black eyes because they don't want the other people, other creatures to see them because they're trying not, not to give away information. We have the white uh, around the iris because... It lets you tell what other people are looking at. And you, we actually have this eerie ability to do it. You know exactly what other people are looking at. Imagine hunting. These creatures are hunting you. And you see one of them. And it, one of them can, like, indicate to the other one across the way that they just saw a deer by, like, looking at the deer. And there's no sound exchanged at all. It's just purely this, like, and, like you have to be pretty smart to do, like, big, very strong theory of mind to do that. If you build something that is a lot smarter than us, not like somewhat smarter, again, within humans, the s smartest people don't rule the earth, obviously. Um, 
but like as much smarter than we are as we are than like dogs, right? Like a, a big jump. That thing is intrinsically pretty dangerous because if it gets set on a goal that isn't that, that, uh, like the, the, the instrumental first instrumental steps, so instrumental convergence. The first instrumental step towards achieving that goal is we'll go first step one. If it, if this is easy for you because you're really just that smart, well, step one just gotta, like take over the planet, right? Like it's like then I just have control over everything, and then and then can step you, two solve my goal. Can you define instrumental convergence for those that didn't sit through three and a half hours yeah. of me talking to Elias or did Yeah, yeah. So so instrumental convergence is this idea that like uh, often when you're trying to achieve a goal. Step one is to achieve a instrumental goal along the way. So like if you want to like, for example, like, uh, uh, what's, what's the book? Paper clips this? is the one that yeah, yeah, no. Used, so, but... uh, no, I, I'm thinking more like an instrumental, instrumental convergence. Uh, I'm trying to give an example for where it happens to people in their people's lives. Um, oh, in chess, um, your actual goal is to checkmate them. But like along the way to checkmating them, checkmating them, most of the time, one of the things you want to do is take their pieces. Now, you could not take their pieces. There's probably, I bet a really a really good chess player against a kind of mediocre one could checkmate them without taking any pieces. Just like trapping their, their but like, that's like even more impressive. But like generally speaking, if you're just trying to win a game of chess, taking their queen, taking their pawns, taking, taking their pieces is a good idea. It like makes it easier to checkmate them. And so I can predict something about almost anyone, any good chess player. They'll take a bunch of their pieces. They'll take the other person's queen. Eventually, probably. Um, in the same way, you can predict uh, that corporations uh, uh, that want to expand into a new market, there's an instrumental goal. It's like step one, they'll probably hire people in that market. It's like just predictable. And in general, if you want to accomplish most goals, like big goals, step one is like accumulate a lot of money and power. Like if you have a, if you have a goal of uh, changing the world accumulating money and power or accumulating followers who like care, listen to you and will do what you say. These things are like obviously good first steps. Even if you don't, you don't, you didn't even know what the next goal was, they would be good first steps. And if you know what it is, they definitely good first steps. Step one, if you can achieve it along the way to, to achieving any big goal, yeah, paper clips is the traditional one, um, is first just to, if you, if you can pull this off, which like you can't, humans can't do this. We don't think of goals like this because we're not, capable enough. But if you could pull it off, step one would be like, well, first, I'm just going to like literally just make sure I have total control over everything at all times. And then step two, I'll like do whatever it is. Step two, do the thing. <laughs> Easy. I already have control over everything. No one can stop me. I have access to all the resources. Simple. Um, and I think people just don't, it's hard, it's hard to have, people don't imagine sufficiently capable as sufficiently capable. Um, and then, so then, and some, pe some people have this idea like, oh, well, what if we just don't give it goals? Well, first of all, we are giving it goals. People are already building agents, but let's just say we didn't. And so you ask this Oracle, what's the best way for me to accomplish goal X? And it knows if it takes you literally, um, and it, and it, it, it actually answers your question correctly. The answer to your question will will be a thing that causes you to bootstrap an AI that then takes over the world yeah. and accomplishes the goal. That's the most reliable way to accomplish that goal. Now, I just laid out a chain of argument with a lot of if this, then this, if this, then this, if this, then this. Uh, I know Eliza thinks that like we're all doomed for sure. Um, I buy his doom argument. I buy the chain and the logic. I just think that like, first of all, I'm less optimistic that the current set of technology is going to get to self-bootstrapping superintelligence. I'm less optimistic than he is that, or you get optimistic or pessimistic, whatever. I'm less, I'm less sure than he is that when it hits that self-bootstrapping step, that uh, that process will be fast and that we will, that there aren't important new discoveries that will take a long time on top of that, that we haven't found. I'm less sure that, uh, uh, so there's an idea of alignment, getting it. You could make the AI such that it wants the same things we want. And then if you ask it to do the thing, it won't go and do horrible things because it's not dumb and it's aligned. And if it wants the same things, it knows what you mean. It's smart. And it has it has aligned goals. Hooray. Like, that'll work great. I'm le uh, 
Elijah thinks that we're like just alignments, this incredibly hard problem that like is almost unsolvable and we're doomed. I'm like not so sure. I think it's a more solvable problem than he thinks it is for a variety of reasons. You know, just it would take too long to like go into. But like my my belief is that it's easier. Um, and so uh, as a result, like my P doom, my probability of doom is like my bid ask spread. And that's pretty high because I have a lot of uncertainty. But I would say it's like between like five and 50. So there's a wide spread, which I think Paul Cristiano, fifty, you know, Paul Cristiano, like who handled, right. uh, you know, a lot of the stuff within OpenAI, I think said twenty five to fifty. It seems yeah. like if you if you talk to most AI yeah. researchers, there's some it, preponderance of people that give that some should, percentage. That should cause you to shit your pants. But it's human level extinction, I think. Yeah, yeah. But no, no, it's not just human level extinction. It's such extincting humans is bad enough. It's like potential destruction of all value in the light cone. Like, like, not just for us, but for any alien species caught in the wake of the explosion. Like, uh, it's like a universe destroying bomb. Like, it's really, if, 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 it's really bad. It's bad in a way that's like, makes global warming, like, not a problem. It's bad in a way that makes no- normal kinds of bad not a, that's not, no- normally I'm like, yeah, we'll just roll the dice. It's fine. We'll figure it out later. Yeah. No, no. Like, this should, go- this is not a figure it out later thing. This is like a, Big fucking problem. Southern Manhattan, Miami might go underwater. Yeah. Like, okay, okay, but this is, we're talking about, and so why do you think, I mean, I, I, it's, it's like someone figured out how to, invented a way to make like 10x more powerful fusion bond, bombs out of like sand and bleach that like could anyone could do at home. Yeah. Um, it's terrifying. And, and I've had enough time with it now that I can laugh about it. When I first realized it was fucking heart stopping. When was that? Uh, probably like it's, it was, it was a dinner I went to before when opening, I was just we had basically right after attention is all you need had been written. Like, and they sort of realized the scaling laws were there and I went to a dinner and someone was there and they were talking about it and they were like, I think we were, were, uh, we actually might be on the the path to build with general AI. Attention, all you need was 2018. Yeah, like tw- I think early 2017. 2017. Um, and Google paper that yeah, yeah, started the Google all paper this that kicked this all off. And uh, and I I heard about the problem. I thought about it. I just had I like I'd been like the eh, the AI doom thing seems plausible. Whatever. Like I don't think an AI is coming anytime soon. So I'm just like not going to think about it that hard yet. Uh, and then I was like, oh maybe. And then I started thinking about it harder. And then I was like, oh shit. Oh, uh oh, <laughs> um, and so uh, uh, I guess the the pro- I believe the proper response is like, unfortunately, this isn't the kind of thing where uh, we can stop forever, and it unfortunately is also the kind of thing where like uh, more time is good. Like I'm actually I'm I'm okay with stretching out the time a little bit, but like ultimately to solve the problem. Um, I think this is one of my biggest points of divergence with uh, Yudkowsky. Um, he is a, a mathematician, philosopher, you know, decision theorist by training. I am an engineer. And my everything I've ever learned about engineering is the only way you will ever get something that works. If you need to work on the first try is to build lots of prototypes and models at a smaller scale and practice and practice and practice and practice and practice. And, and try build, start start building the thing, but like smaller. And if there is a world where we survive, it is, and everything goes wrong, where we build an AI that's smarter than humans and we survive it, it's going to be because we built smaller AIs than that. And we actually had lots of, as many people, smart people as we can working on that and taking the problem seriously. And so I'm, I'm generally, I'm in favor of trying to create some kind of fire alarm where we like, like maybe not AI is bigger than X at some point, like try, trying to like create a, and I actually think there's good reason to believe, like nobody wants to end the world. And this argument is not that hard to understand. And so I actually think there's a good, there's a good option for international co- cooperation and like treaties about some sort of, you know, the, the AI test ban treaty about not bigger than X at some point. I don't think we, I don't think we're actually at the point where it just needs to be not bigger than our, the current AIs are just not that smart yet. But I think we should be moving towards creating that kind of a, some kind of soft, I don't know, we have to figure out what that looks like because it's, it's trickier to set that than it. 
setting that rule is way harder than it looks. Writing good policy is hard. We should be thinking about it now. I just think we don't think we're ready for, for it yet. But in the meantime, on these smaller models, we it is good that lots of people are fucking around with them. It's good that we have more and more people trying to figure out how they work and trying to figure out how you can make them do things, how, figure out how to make them do bad things. The best way to figure out how to stop a big AI from doing bad things, well, not the best way. There's a bunch, it is true. There's a bunch of failure modes for super intelligent AIs that don't exist in less super intelligent AIs. And we better not bet on, oh, don't worry, it works It works in the dumb ones. It'll work, no, no, that's not how it works. You can't do that. But like, we will figure it, we are figuring out more and more about the principles of how it works. And if if we survive, it's going to be because that process produces a a good generalized understanding, a good generalized model of how these kinds of predictive models, which I think includes humans as we are some kind of very complex predictive model with other stuff too, but like that's a big part of what a human is. We'll understand how those work at a deeper level. We'll have some of some science of it actually. And that's what we need. We need a science of AIs. Right now we have an engineering of AIs and no science of AIs. And we need to get use the engineering to bootstrap ourselves into a science of AIs before we build the super intelligent AI so that it doesn't kill us all. Why do you think people are struggling with the discourse around this? Like very smart people oh, seem to abject. Very, it's very, very obvious, very obvious. Mood affiliation rules everything around me. People may, make, don't make decisions on a reasoning basis. I mean, myself included most of the time. I happen to like, I happen to find this problem interesting and compelling on its own. So I spent a lot of time like digging into the arguments themselves because I was like drawn to it. But like most of the time I make decisions the same way as everyone else does. The person pitches me on pitching me on the flat earth thing who's saying that like a bunch of things. I don't really like listen to them. I just like, I can, they say some things and it triggers like, oh, you're part of that tribe. Those people generally, I don't think, think very clearly. I'm just going to discount everything you're saying and ignore you. Yeah. And Robin like, Hansen talks about yeah. 9-11 people and it's like, yeah, yeah. you don't argue with them. You just sort of move on from yeah, the exactly. conversation. And the AI people sound like uh, religious nuts who are telling you about the end of the doomsday end of the world. And it, it sadly pattern matches really nicely, right? Like the AI is like the, you know, is like the antichrist it's coming. And, you know, if, what if we're good, the good AI will come and save us from that. I mean, it's like, it sounds like, like, uh, Christian rapturists. Yes. Um, last of us. It, what was it? Yeah, the... yeah. It, uh, unfortunately, um, reasoning from fictional evidence isn't, doesn't work. And that mood affiliation reminds me of this is not an argument. And the earth is not f round because the flat earther is sound crazy. The earth is round because you can demonstrably see that the earth is round and go measure that yourself. And it's true. And if you make decisions based on anyone who's telling you that doing X will unleash a force, which is going to kill us all. They sound like a bunch of uh, crazy religious people. Because it's never happened before. It's never happened before. Guaranteed, guaranteed the first time that's true, we're all dead. Because you, your algorithm always predicts the same thing. You're the, you're the thing you're going through in your head always predicts the same outcome for anyone who is predicting doom from creating a powerful force beyond human ability. Now... It is true you should be skeptical in general when someone proposes that because there are a lot, there are infinity examples from the past three, you know, 6,000 years of history of people predicting that falsely about things. And, and people, people made imaginary cures for med medicine, medicinal cures for like tinctures that were supposed to cure you for a very, very long time. And then we made one that worked. <laughs> and, and you just can't reason that way. Sometimes, sometimes it's new. Sometimes it's not like before. Usually it's like before, and sometimes it's not. And I, I am personally convinced this time it is not like before. And I encourage everyone who's in that mode, like the main thing that what, what I want you to pay attention to is listen to me like people like me, listen to people like uh, even Yudkowsky, who I, I disagree with him on the amount of doom, but we're like pro cryonics, pro technology, like technology is going to fix all our problems crazies. Yeah. Like if I, if I have a, if I have a defect, it's that I am too pro technology. I want too little regulation. Like if, are you doing cryonics by the way? I have not signed up yet. I really should. I've been, it's one of those things on my to-do list. I'm failing the rationality test. Yes. Um, uh, but, uh, but you're a techno optimist. I'm a techno optimist. And like, and most of you should notice that the people, the people who are affected by this particular one, are not like the people who generally predict 
We're not Paul Ehrlich. Paul Ehrlich is full of shit on like, oh, the doom is coming, the population bomb. He is wrong and weirdly so and refuses to learn from his lesson that he's wrong again. He's wrong over and over again. This is not like that. Like, I am not panicked about global warming. I think I think global warming is a real, a real thing. I don't want to say like, I don't want anyone to walk away thinking like, I think global warming isn't real. But like, I believe I, I believe in technology. The engineers will figure it out. Don't worry. It's going to be fine. I'm like quite sure. Um, it might have some, well, depending on whether we politi- have the political will to get around to it quickly or not, it might have w- more or less dire consequences. But like, we will figure it out eventually. It, it will be fine. We will figure it. We will get this. I do. And it's and, so, okay. So here, here I am being the guy who's like the techno optimist. And I am like, no, no, no. The AI thing, the, the, this thing though, actually maybe, maybe a problem. And I think if you're, if you are rejecting it because we sound like a bunch of crazies, just notice that like at least a, some number of people who are worried about this are not, are on your, I'm on your team. I'm on the techno optimist team. Really Think th- and it and it's not an, it's not obvious why it's true. It takes a good deal of engagement with the material to see why it's true. Because at first, at first, it seems like it shouldn't be that big of a deal. It shouldn't be that big of a problem. But then the more you dig in, the more you realize like, oh, well, actually, but wait a second, and it is. And so like, I just encourage people to engage with the technical merits of the argument. And I always welcome people to come to to you know ask questions, but also like if you want to debate. No, no, I have an idea. We can align it this way, do this, and it will create a, you know, it will create a, the AI that like cares about things we care about. We want your ideas. Like, that's great. Let's have an argument about that. Self improvement won't work. Okay, if no, because like people have said self improvement will work in the past and it never did, then I don't want to hear it because whatever, that's not a real argument. But if you have an actual like argument about how the current learning techniques won't work for that for some reason, engineering reason, Absolutely. Let's talk about it. Well, I'm glad we spent all this time building your credibility as a normal person. Just yeah. to <laughs> go off the rails <laughs> here. But but seriously, I mean, it's uh, it, it is something that people are like genuinely concerned about. And there's no incentive you have. Mark Andreessen published something recently about like AI yeah. and he had a bunch of different points against it. But the AI killing everyone point was the first one. And I, I think it went back to a lot of discourse around people that profit from this is their business and this is how they make money and therefore that's what why they're intended to communicate in this way. You are not I, I as far as I know, your business is not in dooms uh, doomsday scenario planning around AI. I have, I have no financial stake in in either doomsday scenario planning around AI or the other weird like double think forty chess thing people impute to uh, it is like oh, we're actually trying to build up OpenAI and Anthropic as being, and Google as being like super powerful. And it's all an ego thing about making, talking about how amazingly great this stuff is so that we can like earn, raise more money for OpenAI. And, and for like, regulatory capture or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, like, I don't own any equity in any of these things. You're not trying to help your 2006 yes. batchmate yeah, or 2005 batchmate, Sam I, Altman. I, d- no, he's, he's, Sam Altman's really good at raising money. Yes. Like he does not need my help. Yes. I, I promise. Yeah. What would you recommend to people? I mean, uh, if they are curious about all of this stuff and like I, I when people ask yeah, me yeah. about it, because I've had Eliezer on, yeah. they're like, so now what? And yes. I'm like, ah, you know, call your congressman. I don't, I, I, I don't um, know. So there's sort of two paths that you can where you can contribute if you care about this problem. One is um, if you're technical and you're technically minded um, and you think that you, uh, maybe you want to work on it, like go learn how the AIs work and work on interpretability and work on uh, corrigibility and... Can you define those terms? Uh, so interpretability is like understanding what's going on inside the AI. Which we have very little understanding right. of right now. Yeah, and corrigibility is is how do you make a decision-making thing that is willing to be corrected by others? Um, because actually, it's, and that's, kind of a, that's where Eliza has a lot to say about this because it's kind of a decision theory thing. How do you get it to sort of like believe that even though everything it knows seems like this is the best way of doing it, the other people are telling me that's not right. And so I'm open to being corrected by their point of view. How do you make it it's sort of this? Hum, how do you give, how do you give something humility almost in a way? Right. Um, and, and we have no idea to do that either. Um, we've made some, we've made more progress on interpretability than corrigibility, but we've made a little bit of progress on both and we're making more on interpretability and 
what the, my real pitch for this is it's actually really interesting. There's just stuff lying around that no one's checked, no one's tried. It's like a, when the microscope was invented and suddenly like you could just make a scientific career by like pointing microscopes at things. And like there were like lots of things to point the microscope at that no one had ever looked at before. We have a mind you can go look at and examine and experiment with. We've never had one of those before. And so there's a bunch of like interesting kind of like scientific work too. So I would encourage people to go do scientific work on AIs. Go take the AIs other people have built and then the, the engineering and try to see what science you can do to them, particularly around interpreting what's going on inside them or how you get them to accept corrective feedback. Um, if you're more, if you're not technically minded and you don't feel like learning how to like actually build a transformer, um, they, you have, there's less obvious how you contribute directly. But uh, I think mostly like, uh, helping correct the debate and correct the tone of the discussion because this like the super intelligent AI must kill it might kill everyone thing gets wrapped together with a bunch of other concerns about AI that are real they're their things but they're like normal concerns like will it just cause discrimination will job it, loss will it call job loss like I know that like, that stuff's all like a thing but like honestly on those things I sort of feel about it the way I feel about most regulation we're like you know like it's a little early, probably. There probably will be a good regulation to write. We don't know what it looks like. The area is evolving so fast. It's very hard to write good, good regulation. Don't let that get confused. Um, Job loss doesn't kill everyone. Yeah. So there's, so there's, there's, there's AI ethics, and then there's, then then there's AI not kill everyoneism. And the AI not kill everyone thing is like we need the AI to not kill everyone. Th don't let people mush it together. When you see hear people conflating the two correct the record uh, because they're just not the same idea um, and they're not the same kind of problem and they won't be solved with the same kind of tools. And uh, uh, the danger is that those two get sort of wrapped together into some thing that gets rejected by people who are just like, well, I don't, they, who reject the safety, the AI safety, AI ethics stuff that they is like, well, this doesn't really make sense, which I kind of agree with a lot of the people who say like, most of that stuff kind of doesn't make sense to me. I could see in theory, maybe some of it. Um, we will throw out the, the good part with the bad. And a lot of that other stuff is true of almost any technology, right? Yeah, in some yeah, yeah. Ways. That stuff is just general. It's general technological, like, and that's my issues. thing of why I think Silicon Valley, in particular, has has struggled to talk about this. And I don't even know what my fully formed opinions are on this stuff. But it's that for a long time, Silicon Valley has been accused of all the negative externalities that are going to come from. Uh, whatever the technology is that we've integrated around. And so everyone's very used to being defensive about like, oh, job loss yeah, is yeah, pattern coming. matches. This, it, everyone's on the on the defense against any, anything critical, like sort of broadly critical of new technologies because it pattern matches to a bunch of people who go around throwing up, ch throwing chaff in the air, attacking everything all the time, even when it doesn't really make any sense. And so it's easy to slot it into that, to slot the whole thing into that thing and just, you know, throw it away. And I just think like, uh, the, uh, there's, there's a piece of that that is different than the norm, than the norm. And it's hard to, very hard to, mood affiliation drives most of our decision making and it's hard to get people to notice that. Uh, I have three more questions. How are you on uh, time? Can we keep going? That was it. We're almost at 30. So we're way over time. Um, let me see what's my calendar here. Um, Oh, I have to meet my friend. Uh, let me just text my friend real quick. Okay. Um, These won't be nearly as long as uh, AI ethics. All right. All right. Um, there's a graphic you tweeted out about income that you said you keep handy for dinner parties. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you keep that graphic? We'll show it on screen as we're talking. Right. But why, why do you find that graphic so interesting? Um, it shows. I think why... on a more optimistic note than the one we were just on there. Yeah, yeah. It it, it shows. So first of all, the, the fundamentally what it shows is, in general, people getting much richer. Households getting much richer in specific. Um, house, you know. 
the the almost all of it is the, the the bulk of this curve moving down and that the big spike on the right isn't a small number of people getting much wealthier it's a lot more people making 200 that more than two hundred thousand dollars a year like eight percent of the population and for people listening it's like a distribution since 1970 or something yeah. of income and maybe family household, household income house in, in income, real terms and in real terms and so it slides from like a you know sliding kind of smiling graph to being much more on the 200k plus right. side of the axis and but the other thing that happens is it goes from being a pretty defined like bell curve to like this weird, like almost like exponential decay shape. Like there's still a, a lump in the bell curve area, but like it's less and less a bell curve and more and more flat, like an exponential decay curve of people making every bucket, people make, there are slightly fewer people in the bucket, but actually there's about as many people in 40, 000, 30 to 40 as there are in 50 to 60, as there are in 60 to 70, as there are in 70 to 80. It's actually the main story is the flattening of the distribution. And what that flattening means is it used to be there was a normal income. Uh, normal household income was $30,000, $35,000 a year. And if you were within, and some people made a little bit more and some people made a little bit less, but for the most part, everyone was in the mode. They had, they made, they, there, was a, there was a real modal income. The, the, there was a most common income and most people made relatively close, mo almost everyone made relatively close to that, that amount of money. And what has been happening, and then you had some number of very rich people and like medium rich people, but like the bulk of society was in that thing. And what's been happening is uh, there isn't really a norm anymore. We've destroyed the norm. And instead, there's just p some people made a lot more money. Some people made a lot, a lot more money. Some people made a medium amount more money. Some people made a little more money. But like in general, uh, everyone's do making like... Uh, everyone's making more, but the, the, there isn't a, it's hard. Everyone can now look to the person to the left and the person to the right. And there's like lots of people making a lot more money than me and lots of people making a lot less money than me for most people. And that feels bad. It feels like inequality. I mean, it, it also is inequality actually, but, but everyone's getting richer, which is good. And yet somehow it's this flattening that creates a sense of like being left behind. And I don't quite know what to do. Do about it because it, it's a it's a very optimistic story on the one hand of like American households generally getting much wealthier and many many more people having access to more uh, resources which is good that's the good that we like that um, there is a sm slight spike at the very bottom of people with with almost nothing I think that's that is that's also an issue um, and it's not to say there aren't any issues in our society like you know obviously healthcare education um, housing all cost too much but. Like the the real uh, underlying thing that bothers people that, uh, that that on the other side of like this this flattening out, I'm not quite sure how you how do you how do you how do you fix that without like making everyone really poor? There's an easy way to fix it: make everybody poor. <laughs> Go back, everyone take take a bunch of money from for everybody. It's easy to break things. It's easy to make people more poor. Um, and so, I think a big part of what happens there is. As it's, you get spread out more, you have the, the housing in the middle. Um, the people in the middle can't afford things that get bid. If there's a good that gets where there's a limited supply and it's getting bid up and you make you're making more money on that particular good, you are screwed. And that sounds a lot like education and housing to me. Hmm. Um, and so I think that's a that's a big part of why it feels so bad for people, um, which is why I care so much about getting more housing made, making education more available. I think these, these things are very important. You recently turned 40 and you did a Tim Urban-ish layout of your life and time spent doing that exercise. Was it on a weekly basis? Yeah, every week, yeah. Over a week. Did an internalization of turning 40 and laying graphically out how you spent your time, Did were there any takeaways from, from that that you... No, it was, I, I mean, I, I, kind of, I knew the story already. Yeah. Um, it was just kind of cool to see it all laid out. Um, and uh, I guess my biggest takeaway was, man, I spent a long time in school. Yeah. <laughs> like a really long time, yeah. like maybe longer than I needed to. Like maybe I could have started working earlier in retrospect. Yeah, uh, that was not, not that many surprises. It was fun though. It's like fun to. I encourage everyone to do it. It's fun to lay your life out like that and take a look at it. You live in San Francisco. Are you optimistic about San Francisco? Absolutely. The city is uh, doing doing much better than it was during COVID. COVID was very hard on San Francisco. I think um, we have problems. Um, 
you know, the fentanyl crisis is really real. People are dying in the streets. It's like not okay. Um, but we also have a lot of really big advantages. Um, and there's a lot of good happening in the city too. Um, and I'm, uh, I think I'm most encouraged by the number of people I know who uh, have built their careers and their lives here and who are committed to the city and who are not leaving and they're planning to do the work to try to make San Francisco a better place where it's, you know, the core things that everybody cares about, right? Like, you shouldn't be people who don't have anywhere to live dying on the streets. Uh, there shouldn't be obvious rampant crime, people being victimized by that uh, left and right. Uh, there shouldn't be, housing shouldn't be so expensive that like you have to be rich to have access to it. Um, uh, there should be better transit options for people um, that don't, they don't want them stuck in traffic. Like the park, we have more and better parks. Like I don't know, there's, and none of these things are controversial. And in fact, I wouldn't even say any of these things are uh, things that we want. We don't all, we don't have wide agreement that we should go do. Um, it's a matter of, I think that I pretty strongly disagree with many of the people who, about what will cause the outcome. <laughs> I, but I, I think the good news is we're all aligned on wanting the same things. And so it's just a matter of getting the right plan in place with the right people executing it. Um, and these kinds of changes are not... Uh, Startups are all about speed. Um, politics and government policy is all about consistency. And so that's that's sort of where my focus is, just, you know, keep keep turning the wheel. Last one before I let you go. What's what's a piece of conventional Silicon Valley wisdom that you wholeheartedly disagree with or think people get wrong? The, the most of the wholehearted wisdom in Silicon Valley is 100% correct for certain people in certain contexts and 100% wrong for other people in other contexts. And trying to come up with a piece of advice that's always wrong is like pretty hard. Um, because like the, that's, you know, advice is overgeneralization. And so it almost always is true in some context. Um, what about proportionally gets said yeah, and gets you said, think it's gets the said inverse? said a lot and like is, is, should be said relatively, is usually not right. Um, Oh, I, I know. Uh, startups hire A players. Startups should not be trying to hire A players. When I mean, you can be trying if you want. You're not. You're lying to yourself. Uh, you don't know what an A player looks like. If you did, they wouldn't work for you. Um, you might be an A player because you, like, the founding team, like, might be A players. Potentially, you hope. You hope you are. That's your goal. But, like, and you might hire some A players because you attract them and they, like, believe in the mission. I'm not saying you never hire an A player, but they think you're going to hire all A players. I mean, come on. No, you're not. That's just like a lie. And 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 that's okay. And this idea that you can separate people into sort of A players and B players. And I know what people mean by it. It's like you want to hire like the most talented people in the entire world. But actually what you really want to hire are talented people who will work hard and believe in the mission and who want to work for you. <laughs> and like there are a lot of those people and you should go hire them. Um, and... Uh, and that, 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 that idea is just like a, this sort of toxic elite idea that like, I think I just think is ridiculous. Like th that's, you can't do it and you shouldn't try most of the time. And then you have companies um, that are on the very, very cutting edge of technology where you better hire pretty much all A players, you're going to die. And you have to hire very slowly. Re Renaissance Technologies is basically, Renaissance Technologies is a hedge fund that actually hires only eight. Like you have to have published multiple groundbreaking math papers before they'll like, they'll hire you like in statistics. Like they're, they're not joking around. They're actually hiring A players. It might be the most interesting business in the world or at yeah. least on a very short list. Yeah, yeah. It, but like, you're not Rentech. Yeah. Don't kid yourself. Yeah, yeah. Good. Well, Emmett, thanks for doing this. Thank you. It was really fun.